Almost ready. Sorry, one more second here. Okay, so we are good to go. We are now on the website. So I'll hand it off to you, David and Martha. Okay. Well, I um, wanted to jump in and provide a brief welcome, um, provi provide some context of um, where we're picking up, uh, start to tease out a theme to set the tone for the meeting, um, review public comment, and um, introduce David. So to start that off, just welcome everybody um, and thank you for attending. I know that we would all much prefer to be in person, um, but that's not possible right now. And I think we will delve into that, how COVID is impacting um, everybody who's part of this meeting. And, oh, I see some long hair and um, some, <laughs> some haircuts and not haircuts <laughs> on the picture. So um, this, is, this is great that you've all joined. And I wanna state that in recognition of all the good work that is happening, um, we realized that it was still really worth trying a virtual meeting that we at least wanted to try to get together and um, really keep this good work moving. And that gets to the context to remind ourselves of where we're picking up, where we left off. And if you remember last June, we all got together. So just a year ago um, to revisit what value we really do provide as a committee, um, both around local, I local issues and uh, um, subcommittees, and then also regional and national issues facing the committee. And I know for, I can speak for myself, but most of us who are at that meeting left, I think really, inspired and um, fully um, committed to this committee as a whole and recognizing that actually its structure is needed now more than ever to help agencies involved in grizzly bear management uh, navigate emerging issues and promote and coordinate grizzly bear conservation recovery uh, across all recovery areas. And I think today's uh, agenda really reflects that and all the work that's happened reflects that. I also don't want to remind ourselves and certainly the members of the public who are listening in that the IGBC does not have decision-making authority and respects the sovereignty of each member agency. And through mutual agreement, we can take particular action. And um, finally, for this context piece, to remind ourselves of the statement um, that we all committed to, and that is that the IGBC recommitted to its mission to support recovery and delisting and ongoing conservation of grizzly bear populations and their habitats in areas of the Western United States through interagency coordination of policy, planning, management, research, and communication. So i um, proud of everyone for coming up with, I think, that really strong statement. We also recognized um, the need to remain relevant and, and committed to improving how we consider issues raised by subcommittees, advisory groups, and the public. And I think you will see an attempt at that throughout this agenda, but a full recognition that it would be a lot better if we could do this in person. Um, and so that gets to the public comment piece of this meeting that there's an opportunity to provide written comment throughout and I'll be checking in with Dylan uh, to see when those come in and then there's a time at the end of the agenda for public comment. We had hoped had the meeting been in person we would have been a little more innovative with public comment and allowed for it throughout so that's something we look forward to doing when we get to be in person. So to set the tone of the meeting, the theme um, certainly that I'm seeing, David actually uh, said this analogy and it, it struck home for me, is that it feels like right now everyone is turning in their homework and that homework's piling up on the teacher's desk. 
we're the teachers, the IGBC is in this instance. And so um, really it's to get the presentations, get that information, let us hear that information during this meeting, know that there's gonna be um, further discussion between now and the July meeting, and then really teeing it up for um, what we're gonna do with all of that homework piling up on our desk and how do we take some actions and provide the guidance that's being requested of us um, at the July meeting. So uh, I also wanna uh, give a shout out to the advisory team that they've done the hard work setting up this meeting without having an executive coordinator in place. And during COVID, they've been really um, innovative and creative and have carried the theme and the context of what the IGBC wants to be doing. I think they've really put that together for us and have kept the ball rolling. So with that, I want to introduce David Diamond, who's facilitating the meeting for us. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Martha. Um, so yes, once again, so my name is David Diamond. I'm an employee with the National Park Service. I work with the federal land managers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So that's the Park Service and the Forest Service and BLM and Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm happy to be serving as your facilitator today. Um, let me quickly bring up our slide deck. So again, as Martha mentioned, if you're joining this um, and streaming it on the IGBC website, um, you can send written comments really at any point um, uh, to Dylan Tabish and we'll be checking in. Dylan's gonna be on the call the entire time. Um, and then we also will have the opportunity for a phone in uh, at the end. And then for the members of, of the committee who are on the Zoom call, you know, we've already all done the, the mic checks and the camera checks. It's really great to see everybody. Um, and uh, so we'll just dive right in. So, um, well, too far. <laughs> um, this is sort of the, the roster um, and there's always, you know, with a group this large and at this level, we always have um, transitions and, and new folks joining. Um, but for, the, for, for folks who are joining on the phone, I want them to be able to be aware of, of who this IGBC is. Um, and I, I guess I'm sort of torn about leaving this uh, slide up or just letting people's faces be seen um, as we go through the, the roll call. Um, for folks who are joining on the, on, online, the, the agenda has this same list on the second page. So I think I'm gonna take this off the screen and I'm gonna ask folks um, to just uh, briefly say hello. And we're gonna go through the, the uh, um, uh, agency updates in a moment. Um, but let's start um, with uh, Idaho, Idaho's representative. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Toby Boudreau, and I am the Chief of Wildlife for Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And uh, I've been on IGBC for um, almost two years. So anyways, fairly new and uh, just uh, really, uh, really excited about the work we do and uh, always trying to improve it. That's about it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Toby. Uh, obviously, you've already heard from Martha uh, Williams, the chair from Montana. So let's go next to uh, a new member, um, uh, Hannah Anderson from Washington. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Anderson. I'm new to IGBC. I am the um, diversity division manager at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I imagine you all know Penny Becker, who um, recently held this role. And She's moved on and I now ha um, have her position. I'm super excited so to be um, here with you all. I've been, I'm gonna say grizzly bear adjacent for many years now, been at the agency four or five years um, and working closely with Penny, but um, I'm excited to be uh, the DFW representative for this group. So thank you for having me. Great, welcome Hannah. Great. Um, Wyoming. Yeah, thank you. I'm Tim Woolley. I supervise our statewide wildlife and habitat management section out of Cheyenne, although I am teleworking out of Cody, Wyoming today. I've been involved with the IGBC since about 2017, and I'm also involved with the YES Committee, and I'm glad to be here. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim. So those are the four states that are part of IGBC. Uh, then we have a series of federal agencies. We'll start with the Forest Service, which actually has four regions 
uh, represented here because every one of the recovery zones uh, affects forest service managed lands. So um, region one, or actually Jackie, we'll start with you. Hey, can you hear me okay? Sure can. All right. So Jackie Buchanan, uh, Deputy Regional Forester for the Rocky Mountain region. I will, um, I'm the, not co-chair, but the chair coming in behind Martha um, transition this fall and have been in and out of this group for uh, quite a few years. And so um, looking forward to the conversations today and uh, interested in what comes out of uh, some of the um, interactions we may have with, with folks. So just happy to be here. And I'm in Denver, Colorado, teleworking like everybody everybody else. So that Thanks, would be Jack. it. Uh, region one, Forest Service. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Melanie Glossa. I'm the Deputy Regional out of Missoula here in Montana. Uh, let's see, I've been on the IGBT about a year and uh, on, I was on the Yes Committee for oh, since about 2014 prior to that. So good. Great. Thanks. We're having a little bit of issues with your microphone there, Melanie. So for next time, we'll try to clear that up. Um, region six. Hi, everyone. Uh, Eric Johnston here in uh, Portland, Oregon, teleworking from home as I have been for the last many months. Um, have long time association with um, IGBC. Look forward to the conversation, the continued trajectory that that we're we're on um, and Martha referenced uh, with our uh, our summer meeting last year. Anyhow, nice to see you all. Thanks, Eric. Good to see you. And I, I wasn't didn't notice if we had a Region Four rep today from the Forest Service. Mary Farnsworth is on. She was calling in, I believe. Um, I got a note from her. Okay, we'll watch for her. Okay. And we'll move on to the Park Service. Uh, let's see. Uh, from the Pacific West, I know we had Karen. Hi, everyone. Uh, Karen Taylor Goodrich. I represent the Pacific West region for the National Park Service. And um, I'm also the superintendent at North Cascades National Park Service Complex in Washington State. And right now I'm in Bellingham, Washington and teleworking like you all. It's, it's great to see you all and hear from you. And it's, uh, I'm glad we're able to do this virtually one way or another, but um, I've been trans I'm transitioning from the chair position. I've been with the IGBC for almost seven years or so uh, as chair and also the regional rep um, and now transitioning away from the chair and just serving as the regional national park service rep. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Karen. Uh, do we have Jennifer Carpenter from the Intermountain region? Yes, I'm trying to figure out how to turn on my camera, start video, sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Carpenter. I am the Associate Regional Director for Resource Stewardship and Science for the National Park Service, the Legacy IMR Intermountain Region, which is DOI Region 6, 7, and 8. And um, new to this committee as of six months ago, this will be my second meeting. Uh, so it's great to see everyone, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful meeting. Thank you, David. Thanks, Jennifer. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, two regions represented, starting with Region 1. I know I saw it. Sorry about that. I had some user error going on. Um, yeah, this is Jim Onsworth. I'm the Assistant Regional Director of the Science Program here in Portland. And I, I think I said it last time, I'm, this is the third agency I've represented on this uh, organization. So looking forward to a good meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Region 6 in Denver. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Hogan, the Deputy Regional Director for you, you heard uh, Jennifer, say the region formerly known as we used to be region six. We're now oh, interior regions five and seven, which average out as six. So just to make it simple, we'll keep it as six. Uh, Mountain Prairie region, I've been on the IGBC for about seven years now. So only representing one agency. So not bouncing around like Unsworth, but uh, <laughs> we, we can probably compete, Jim, for who's been in the minor leagues the longest. So good to see everyone. Thanks, Matt. Um, 
So next up was BLM, uh, represented by the Montana Dakota State Office. Uh, <clears throat> Mike, were you here? Did you, did you, I think you had to step away at the beginning of the hour. Mike Philbin. We'll catch him when it's time for the BLM report. Um, the US Geological Survey. Hi, hi, David um, and everyone. Uh, I'm Claudia Reagan. I'm the center director for the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center, headquartered in Bozeman, and I represent USGS to the executive team. And um, I've been, um, I guess I've been interfacing with IGBC since about 2015. So good to see you all virtually. Thanks, Claudia. And uh, now one of the, the, you know, there's just, obviously we would prefer to be in person together, uh, particularly since the summer meetings are, are sort of field visits. But one of the benefits of these, these virtual meetings is that we, we, we have, uh, we can transcend some of the geographic space uh, that we cover. So we're, we, we're, we're, we're honored to have both um, Alberta and British Columbia represented here with the group today. Um, so let's start with uh, Alberta. Hi everyone, uh, it's Paul Frame here in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be able to participate again. I think the last time I actually participated in a IGBC meeting was back in summer of 2015. So uh, international travel is pretty limited for us. So this is, uh, this is nice and I'm looking forward to, to participating today. Thanks. Terrific, thanks Paul. And from uh, British Columbia. Hello everyone. I'm Garth Mowat. I'm the large carnival specialist for British Columbia and I'm representing Jen Salakis today, our director of wildlife in British Columbia. I'm working out of my office, unlike most of you in Nelson, BC. So <clears throat> far from where many of you are. Great. So that is our sort of executive um, committee membership. We have five subcommittees and you'll meet the chairs of those subcommittees when we do their updates here in a moment on the agenda. Um, so that we're, we're, we're sort of on time. We were gonna do a breakout room, but uh, in the webinar version of Zoom, that's not a possibility. So it, we, we substituted that little brief introduction so you could see everybody's uh, smiling faces and you know, get that intimate view into people's living rooms. Um, let me share the screen. And we'll start the updates. And the idea again here is this is not. Uh, oh, well, so just again to review the agenda, we'll do these quick updates, uh, things that your colleagues need to know that's happening in, in your agency. Um, and then we're also going to be seeing what effects, if any, uh, uh, COVID's having on bear management this summer. Um, and then we will hear from the, uh, the subcommittee updates. Um, and then we have some pretty significant items of business. Um, to attend to this, this afternoon. And then we will take that break. Uh, so no matter what's happening at 2.45, we're gonna give you those 15 minutes. And then as Martha mentioned, the afternoon um, after the break really is these reports, these very substantive reports from um, folks that are, that are working under you as the executives in the information education outreach group, in the subcommittee groups that have been working on these conflict reduction reports. And then also we're gonna get a report separately from the state of Montana and from their, their Citizens Advisory Council. So it's a very full agenda, mostly informational. And the idea is we've got three hours set aside or actually four hours set aside in July. So one month from now, where you'll have a chance to um, take this input today and then think about what, what next steps you wanna get moving um, from all of your, your, uh, your staff that are, that are working these bear issues. So, We'll dive in then to the updates, uh, starting with Hannah and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I will just ask and make sure, Hannah, that you can see your slide there. I, I can, and thank you so much. It's sort of the vein of having a name that starts with A. I'm always at the top of the list, even though I'm the <laughs> first one and I haven't been here before, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, thanks for the moment. Um, to two things that came to mind when I was thinking about those key updates. Um, just sort of new for us, we had a possible um, grizzly bear cattle depredation uh, just recently, this last month. 
And it sort of highlighted for us that um, we need to work a little to sort of develop these clear response protocols and communication plan between us and um, partners, including US Fish and Wildlife Service, so that we can be um, as prepared as possible for that to occur um, in the future, should it occur. And so I think some of our folks on the ground will be reaching out to some of your folks on the ground in other states um, to uh, build on and uh, learn from you all. Um, so that happened. It was very Hannah, your, your uh, video, your voice is cutting in and out. You can try. Oh my goodness. This happens to me with Zoom. I don't know why. Let me see if I can, let me just. Sorry to interrupt, but I could see Jim moving forward to try to hear. <laughs> Now it looks like we might have lost Hannah. Sometimes turning the video off can help if they're having bandwidth issues. Yep. Okay, well, if we may have to come back to Hannah. So next up, um, Toby is uh, Idaho Fish and Game. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, our key update is that uh, we did confirm uh, grizzly bear uh, near Grangeville, Idaho. Um, kind of interesting story. Uh, I won't go into great depth, but uh, the bear had been formally marked in the Selkirks and uh, made its way down. And if you sort of draw, put a put a nice piece of uh, yarn on the map. Uh, I still like paper maps. Um, it shows that it, you know, went over 225 miles to where uh, we detected it um, outside of Grangeville. And we detected it in a uh, last summer in a, a bear bait, uh, black bear baiting um, uh, camera that uh, the hunter, uh, gave us the pictures. We went up and collected some samples. We were, it was one of those could be bears. And uh, we sent it off for genetic analysis and confirmed that it was indeed a grizzly. And then uh, this spring, um, just outside of uh, Grangeville, uh, near a Nordic uh, ski area, um, we found pretty convincing tracks of a grizzly bear. Um, we backtracked it and foretracked it, um, tried to find some genetic samples, um, didn't find anything that was meaningful, but the hair follicles uh, associated with the tracks um, are consistent with grizzly bears. So um, that bear now is a four-year-old and so far has not gotten in any trouble. There's quite a bit of cattle ranching uh, in that area. So, uh, so that's a good thing. And um, and he is uh, he's a four-year-old male, and uh, he's not gotten into trouble. So, um, I, so that's sort of interesting. We haven't uh, we haven't had any more reports of him or his whereabouts uh, since uh, since you know in uh, early quite earlier in the in the winter or late in the winter. So. Um, other than that, um, you know, Idaho Fishing Game is trying to get everybody back to work starting Monday. Um, we've been teleworking since the middle of March and we are trying to get everybody back. And I know that I had a staff meeting this morning and I one of the staff members came on late because evidently there was a <clears throat> grizzly bear related wildlife human attack response uh, incident uh, that happened in Montana, but the victim evidently was transported to an Idaho hospital. So the woman that was involved in it is, uh, is fine. And then a few weeks ago, we had another incident um, near Island Park, um, near Henry's Lake. And uh, that gentleman uh, survived a bite to the belly. <clears throat> And uh, he was in good spirits and uh, told his story freely to the media and 
put it out on social media. So uh, the uh, if you didn't see that, uh, it, it's 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 worth uh, it's worth checking out. He had a very interesting and really good perspective on you know, what was going down as he was uh, being uh, overwhelmed by a bear. He did have bear spray on and so did his wife, but uh, nothing happened to his wife with him. But uh, yeah, so we've had our uh, conflict so far and uh, we've uh, moved some bears um, and we're gonna be full speed and full staff for uh, the upcoming uh, research collaring effort in and around the Island Park area. And I just got another, um, note uh, from the Selkirk's Cabinet Yak area and Brian Johnson, our uh, grizzly bear uh, conflict person up there, is dealing with a <clears throat> grizzly bear and set a trap today. So uh, they're out and they're getting into uh, beehives. So got that going. Um, other than that, uh, you know, despite the downturn in the economy, um, Idaho Fishing Game is uh, doing well. We sold out all of our elk tags already uh, to non-residents uh, uh, because I think that uh, with all this time on people's hands, I think they're going to go hunting this fall. So that's that's a good thing. And um, yeah, so <clears throat> things are going good here. Um, and hopefully uh, everybody stays safe and healthy, uh, both in our agency and yours. So uh, that's about all I have to report, unless anybody has any questions. Perfect, thanks, Toby. Sorry, next up, uh, Martha Williams with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Thanks, David. And um, I, I'd say we, I would echo many of the comments that Toby just said. I'm glad at least everyone on this call is healthy. We have seen um, an uptick, I think, in um, recreation users during COVID, we've seen a lot of people out. I know our state park saw a 60% increase in visitation um, as COVID first hit. We've um, really been up and running all along as far as our grizzly bear work, um, some of our essential services, but all of our staff are not back in the office yet. And um, we don't have a clear plan on what that will look like um, yet, but certainly, all of the bear work uh, continues. We, um, just like everyone else, have seen a lot of bear activity and in the expanded areas. So um, where we're used to seeing it, but also um, bear activity where we've not seen it before. So have been really busy. And in thinking of your question, setting up the meeting, uh, David, what do I hope to get from our time together today? I think it's um, realizing these commonalities that we are all sharing and uh, that are across recovery areas and um, how we have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, like the other states, um, we are also expecting a really busy hunting season if we're able to continue it. So um, lots of interest in that recreation. Um, and then later on on the agenda, Heather Stokes is going to present on our Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. That's something we've been really involved with and um, following closely and shepherding along. I, I guess I would ask, add one more thing that goes to four though, David, is just we are seeing the need to coordinate with our partners, federal, tribal, and other states, um, we're seeing how that's just really important. So thanks. Thanks, Martha. And I see that Hannah has joined us again. Uh, let's give it another shot. We, we, we had I'm so sorry about that. I was trying to make the sound better and I made the whole thing break. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, is it okay? All right. Um, okay. So quickly, uh, we did have a recent possible grizzly bear depredation um, just this last month. Um, we weren't able to confirm um, if it were a grizzly bear or black bear, um, but there was indication that it was bear, a big bear. Um, so it sort of highlighted for us that um, having not had that experience um, much or not in the recent past, certainly, um, the need to um, 
Concerned. Sure, we have good response protocols that our staff are ready for that should it occur again, a communications plan and others. So just to prepare for any future events. And so I know some of our on the ground folks will be reaching out to um, our partners in other states and um, other places who have um, maybe dealt with that situation a little bit more than we have. Uh, also, just, you know, secondly, the other big deal, right, in our state, uh, we're still waiting for the decision or the update on the North Cascades Ecosystem Recovery um, EIS. And then as far as COVID-19 effects, you know, like you all, we're all on mandatory telework, the offices remain closed. We have been able to open for field work um, at the beginning of the beginning of this month. Um, we had to put in place, you know, safety trainings and clear SOPs and get PP, proper PPE and all that um, business so that we can safely um, conduct field work. Certainly our staff were very eager and um, dedicated and it was hard to be shut down during a spring field season. That one piece I didn't say on here that um, also we're feeling an effect of COVID in our state economy. Um, we have been asked by uh, our Office of Financial Management to identify um, budget reductions, um, both for the next fiscal year and for the next upcoming biennium. And we've just recently, our governor recently implemented furloughs for state employees starting um, on Monday. So one a week, one day a week on Monday for the month of July, and then one day a month through November. Thanks for the update, Hannah. Tim Woolley, Wyoming. Hey, hopefully I don't have any kind of internet problem. It was ironic because the internet guy came to the door just when we got started because he wanted to check the system. So hopefully it'll hold up while I, I give you this brief update. So um, one of the big things is everybody's um, been talking about is teleworking. And really once we moved into that situation, a lot of us that worked in offices were able to work from home. And we made sure that we didn't have any lapse in service to our publics and, and our ability to go out and do our work, whether it's collecting data or um, being able to respond to calls. So that was a key thing we stayed with. Um, we've done a really good job. We've incorporated CDC guidelines into our, um, our interactions with the public. So I thought that was probably pretty, pretty key is the fact that we haven't really skipped a beat in, in our ability to serve our public and our conserve our wildlife resource. Um, a second item that's probably pretty important, and it was interesting to hear um, Hannah from Washington bring it up, is that Wyoming is pretty dependent on our state budget on energy resources such as coal, oil, and gas. And with the pandemic and changes in the energy markets, um, the state of Wyoming is going through really a big financial crisis where um, government agencies are, are having to look at streamlining their budgets. Um, our uh, administration had the foresight back towards the beginning of the year that we, um, even though we're financially really sound and we're selling licenses, um, we kind of plan for those bad events. And so when something like this came up, our administration had the foresight um, to be able to go through and look at these things. And so when the governor wanted um, state agencies to look at streamlining our budgets, we already had kind of planned for that rainy day. and. Um, we're able to go through and make those budget efficiencies um, and be able to maintain our service and not um, um, be able to, to um, not meet our mission of conserving wildlife and serving people. So um, I think that's working along. By the end of summer, we're gonna have to try to cut some more. There's a lot of things on the plate, but I think um, what we're doing is, is really being um, prudent to be able to look and realize that the economy is gonna be pretty stagnant for a while and we're going to be able to meet that and meet our mission of, of working with um, um, the public and being able to, to do our job. And then finally a grizzly bear related topic, we, um, we had a couple of bear human conflicts, one in Du Bois and Cody. And what's kind of significant, it was another um, recreation related activity. These, these both of these uh, um, people that were out on the um, wildlife habitat management areas were out hunting antlers, shed antlers. and uh, they encountered bears and both were, were injured. Um, I don't think either one was life-threatening, although they were serious. Um, one of them, the bear actually bit the guy's bear spray, so that helped deter it. Um, so anyhow, we had those two conflicts so far and it was a, a bear-human interaction related to, to um, recreation. Kind of related to that, one more thing is that um, I talked with our 
Jennifer, our Bearwise coordinator. And um, at the YES meeting, one of the things we talked about with one of the YES members was working on a video for guides and outfitters on safety in the backcountry. And that's something that we started working with the Wyoming Guides and Outfitters Associated Association to be able to uh, work on that video to improve safety in the backcountry. So that's, that's underway. And um, yeah, we're still teleworking until we get our return to work plan, which is, um, we're not sure when that's gonna be, but we're gonna continue um, working how we've been doing it since about uh, the first part of April. So that's about all I have right now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. So British Columbia, and so Garth, you've got uh, three, three separate slides here. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you and you just tell me when you want the next one, okay? Yeah, no problem. I, I wasn't sure how much uh, you've heard from British Columbia in the last few years. The former rep from British Columbia, Tony Hamilton, retired several years ago, and I, I really don't think you've heard much from us. That's my impression anyway. So I just want to give you a, an overview as to what we're, <clears throat> what we have going on with grizzly bear management. Um, is that the first slide, David? The first one was the overview that had the three. Yeah, okay, yeah, perfect. Thanks for it. You can move on, yeah. So we, we, um, we've we just revised the threat assessment for grizzly bear, the grizzly bear populations in British Columbia. This will be available on the website in the next few uh, weeks. Uh, it was a nature serve, modified nature serve method. The, the, the goal behind this was really to help our management agency. I don't know that it, it's, uh, it's a very outward looking thing. It's mainly to help the regional managers in the forestry field and fish and wildlife field to look at the various populations in the region and, and assess how well they're doing. And you can see the colors, they, things get better for bears as you go north, there's no surprise there. A lot of these things are driven by uh, the, the red and, and the orange uh, categories are driven by uh, um, uh, mortality, uh, human caused mortality, non-hunting mortality. We haven't had a grizzly bear hunt for two years now in British Columbia. Um, so all of the mortality conflicts are driven by non-hunting mortality. All of the mortality is driven by non-hunting conflicts. Um, so there was uh, a little bit of update to the boundaries. The grizzly bear population is expanded in parts of the gray areas you see there, the, and um, uh, including along the boundary to the, uh, along the American border to the west, to the east side of the gray area in what we call the Granby, or the boundary population, there's been some expansion into the extirpated zone. So the population of grizzly bears is expanding a little, little, a little bit all the time in British Columbia in the last 20 years, probably. David, you could go to that. And we have, uh, we're working on a grizzly bear management plan. We've never had one in British Columbia, believe it or not. It's, uh, we, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but I think we probably haven't had one because it would have been such a controversial thing to create in British Columbia because there's so such a strong polemic about uh, grizzly bear management, especially grizzly bear hunting in British Columbia. We no longer have a hunt and we are, um, we've just started working on the uh, first steps of the grizzly bear management plan. And this uh, first step is engagement with First Nations. And we have a, uh, perhaps this, this slide and this point, relates most closely to the IGBC. We have a, a working group with First Nations, environmental organizations, and several uh, levels of government looking at recovery of grizzly bears in the southwest corner of the province. Uh, the, the population that that uh, relates most closely to you folks is the North Cascades population. Uh, right now, there is a population that is uh, threatened, uh, endangered, but not perhaps as threatened as the North Cascades. And we call it the Stein Hatlatch population. It's on the west side of the Fraser River. And we're putting uh, some effort into uh, recovering uh, numbers in there. There's about 24 bears in that whole area. It's about 8,000 square kilometers. So it's, it's a, um, a very small population. It's quite isolated. It's the most genetically isolated population we have in BC. And we're uh, hoping to augment this population with some sub-adult females this fall. Uh, we also have some other work going on the ground with respect to access management and trying to minimize mortalities. So hope, uh, you might see hope there at the very uh, bottom part of your slide. 
uh, the lower mainland uh, uh, so the, the 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 washington border is only about uh 40 kilometers south of hope or 50 kilometers south of hope um the last the the next thing that we want to do with this group is to um prepare the documentation required to seek the approval for the government of British Columbia to consider recovering grizzly bears in the North Cascades uh, portion of British Columbia. Uh, this is strongly supported by First Nations in the area and a lot of the motivation comes from First Nations in fact. Um, so we're in the process of doing that now and, and uh, uh, we take a lot longer than we, the time we have now to talk about what we are doing. It's, it's scoping work, habitat scoping, uh, and uh, access scoping and mortality risk scoping, hazard assessments, things like that. We're, we're probably halfway through what we need to, to do um, for that um, work. And do I have another slide, David, or is that it? That, that, that was it that I had. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Garth. Uh, terrific to get that update and to have you uh, with us. Uh, so next up, uh, Paul Frame from Alberta. We may, you may still be muted there, Paul. Yep, sorry about that. Um, trying to shuffle. I had something that I was gonna be using for reference covering the, covering the mute button. Right, so uh, so three points, I guess, that I thought I would uh, present the, to this group that might be interesting are, um, so we, so, uh, grizzly bears have been listed as threatened in Alberta since 2010. Um, we, we identified a, a, a need for changed change, uh, changes in management strategies earlier than that and came up with a, a recovery plan in 2008. Um, that was a five-year recovery plan from 2008 to 2013. We started the update process in early 2013, uh, had a final draft by 2015, put it out for public consultation in 2016, and it's been working its way through our internal process ever since. Um, it's, uh, we had a change in government last year, which slowed things down a little bit, but, um, but we're finally, this, the new government is ready to release our updated grizzly bear recovery plan for uh, in, in the next few weeks here. Um, so that's exciting for us. Um, I don't know, and maybe interesting to, to you all. Um, so the, the main thing, the main difference in this new updated plan from our previous plan, uh, basically is we just, we identify spatially where the government intends to recover grizzly bears to help focus our efforts a little bit and help, um, help ease some of the public concern about what it is that we're trying to do when we talk about recovering grizzly bears. Um, so, that, so, that's, uh, so that's exciting to finally have that coming close to being done. I've been in this position since June of 2016 and the second email in my inbox was with a call from a colleague to start working on this recovery plan. So we're real excited to have this almost ready to go. Um, and a part of why we're really excited to have this almost completed is that um, while we've been in the process of developing a recovery plan and recovery strategy, the grizzly bears have been recovering, right? So we haven't been hunting them. Um, we've been working at public education and outreach to reduce human bear conflicts, which require us to move bears or put bears down. Um, so, so we've been seeing a, um, an expansion in numbers and range in Alberta. Um, so so we're, our next steps are, so we get the plan in place and then within the next couple of years, we hope to have an, an updated status assessment. Now, there's a couple of populations that are still, the status is questionable, so we may not change it from threatened to at risk, but, um, but at least we will have a, a, a more thorough understanding of, of, uh, of the status of the bear population in Alberta here. 
And then another point that I just I thought would be relevant to a lot of members of this group was is that our um, FRI research grizzly bear program, which uh, Gord Stenhouse has been leading for the last 23 years, is is scheduled to come to a, an end at the end of this fiscal year. So he's been on secondment from the government to the Foothills. Well, it used to be Foothills Research Institute. Now it's just FRI research. Um, He's been on secondment for that period of time, 23 years, and uh, and that agreement is coming to an end. So that's going to, to end that program, which is unfortunate because uh, you know most of what we know about the grizzly bear population in Alberta has come through research done by uh, Gord Stenhouse and that group. So so that'll be a, a big uh, gap for us. Um, but you know we'll we'll carry on. Um, and that was that was it. Just real quick, kind of where we're at here in Alberta. Glad to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we're moving on through now th through the federal agencies. Um, oops, I went past one. So we have multiple representatives um, from the Forest Service, but uh, maybe Jackie, uh, if you could, or, or or one of the four of you, could give us the quick update. Um, move it along because we're going to try to get to the business items starting at the, at the top of the hour. Um, so, hey, this is Jack. I can go uh, real quick um, and I'll start with, well, you know, we've got a couple of things going on with the grizzly bears and some lawsuits uh, working with our uh, state partners um, really tied into the, the black bear thing, but working through that. Um, have been challenged. Uh, I'll let, Re well, Region 4 can talk about uh, the issue in Wyoming, uh, but have some challenges there in the upper green. Um, the big thing for us on the COVID, uh, it is, we're, we're shades of gray across the U.S. Forest Service in regards to where we're at for getting back into offices. For the Denver um, regional office, we just heard today that the earliest we can get in there is probably going to be somewhere around the 27th of July. Um, and then with our, all of our district offices and four supervisor offices, you know, that varies according with what's happening in the state in the location um, that, that they reside in. And again, soup to nuts for us, uh, you know, we, we cover Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, Kansas, and Nebraska. Uh, Colorado has been kind of holding steady as just holding steady, although we've had um, some areas really show an uptick in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, if you go to Wyoming, I think they're seeing an uptick uh, and same thing, Nebraska, Kansas. And so it, it's that's how we will move forward in regard to having our folks uh, back in the office. Now, we are still continuing you know, with um, as much work as we can, but we've had to adjust uh, based off of some things like um, only having one person in a vehicle or really thinking through, um, you know, how, how folks can work together and move together. And, uh, and so that, that has reduced some of our um, probably normal activity. But, you know, it's field season. And so we're doing everything we can to get out and uh, to be out on the ground. Um, and we'll see how it goes with COVID. Uh, that's, it's uh, every day is a new thing. We're talking, trying to um, maybe consider some testing. Well, it's fire season for us. So that adds in this complexity and then uh, uh, definitely an in intensity around um, our folks moving in the field. Um, I'll stop there and because I know, I think I've seen Mary Farnsworth join and Eric or Mel, Melanie. Um, I'll let you guys add in some of the particulars real quick, if you can. Well, I guess I could, this is Eric. Um, I could chip in a little bit on some of the litigation uh, stuff. And, and basically for us in the Pacific Northwest, it's kind of westward movement of some of the litigation issues that those of you that are east of us are, are quite familiar with, um, like the, the issue of um, where bears may be present. And so, you know, the protocol the Fish and Wildlife Service is working on right now is is really timely in in, in that regard to to nail that down 
Um, and then there's also, you know, further over in the Cascades, there's there's uh, the the issue of uh, relative to um, consultation at the plan level has arisen, um, and that that had its genesis actually with links over in Montana. But anyhow, again, west westward movement of some of the issues that have been litigated over there, and I, I don't really have anything else to add on COVID. Um, Jackie, I think covered that well. I think most of our regional offices are, are still in telework mode. And as she said, the more rural and outlying are, are opening up um, based on local circumstance and, and, and decisions there. I, I guess that the only other thing I would add is that our, our, our focus has been on health and safety of employees in the public first and foremost. And uh, I think we noted or it's noted in there uh, down there that the whole issue relative to recreation and how we handle recreation sites has been been huge um, and coordinating with with states and so on and so forth so that we're we're consistent in that regard that that's what i would chip in yeah and to follow up on what eric just said you know we in region two we're seeing like double the impacts and double the visitation rate from what we normally would see I, I would bet that's the same for everybody. Um, it's because I think folks are not, they're going where they can drive. They're not flying. And so it's just really pushed the public out. So, um, you know, I, if anything, I would expect we may have some more conflicts this year just because of the increased presence of bodies out there. Hey, David. Hey, go ahead, Chris. Sure. Yeah. Melanie's having some audio problems. So she just wanted me to touch base on some Northern region items that maybe just expand a little bit that's in the bullets. So the other thing that we've seen in some litigation here recently is, um, is going to test the uh, demographic connectivity areas related to the NCDE. Um, we have a recent uh, NOI on that for a, a, a project on the Lolo National Forest that is proposed in that DCA. I'm still working closely with both states of Wyoming and Idaho on the bear baiting lawsuit and how that's moving forward. Um, and then also kind of coming up with some new uh, monitoring procedures around how we how we determine effectiveness of our road closures. And so we lost the lawsuit on that here um, earlier this year. And that's we're starting to see that also affect some other, you know, other uh, that was a lawsuit in the Selkirk Kevin Yak ecosystem, and we're starting to see that argument come up in some of the other ecosystems. And so, making sure that we identify those, the effective road closures, and how we consult on those. I think the only other thing related to COVID that I we haven't heard is we definitely see see are going to see a shorter field season this year with delay in the hiring of seasonals, and then um, with a lot of the universities trying to start earlier than normal. And so we we'll probably barely get two months of a, a field season with our seasonals this year. So I think data collection and and monitoring is going to be a lot a lot more limited uh, for us this year than what we've seen in the past. Thanks. So hey David, this is Jackie and Mary Texton said she's having some trouble. So if Trisha is on. She asked that Trisha um, update for Region Four. I can do that, and this will be pretty quick. And I was actually going to touch on this in the in my update for yes, so um, it'll be one less thing to do there. Um, and again, it's around litigation. I I won't add anything to COVID because I think you've all covered what we're dealing with in Region Four. But in terms of litigation, um, Jackie had mentioned Upper Green, which is a a large grazing project on the Bridger Teton. Um, we were litigated from the final um, decision on that. And the focus of the litigation is uh, predominantly grizzly bears and predominantly the amount of incidental take that is allowed under the biological opinion. Both agencies, both Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service are sued over this. Um, we were uh, um, subject to a request for a preliminary injunction. Um, we had the hearing on that a couple weeks ago. And the relief the plaintiffs wanted would have been no lethal take up there this year, which would have been extraordinarily problematic for the permittees, uh, uh, Wyoming Game and Fish, and Fish and Wildlife Service who manage bears up there. So uh, we actually prevailed, and the judge did not allow the preliminary injunction, so we're not enjoined. 
And um, so we're moving along uh, with putting cows out there as we speak and working um, on conflict reduction and we'll go through that lawsuit um, and, and as it moves along. So end of update. Great, we're seeing thumbs up from the Forest Service. Ah, okay. So Park Service is next. Uh, Karen or Jennifer, you wanna kick it off? Hi, this is Karen. Um, thanks, David. And I'm gonna tag team this with Jennifer Carpenter. We're representing two regions, as you can see. Uh, they're actually Department of the Interior regions, you know, eight, nine, 10, and 12, and then various other regions. But um, for this purpose, we'll call them Intermountain Region and Pacific West Region. I'm on the West Coast, of course. Um, the key updates um, for COVID, um, as you can imagine, like all of you have already discussed, is it di directly impacting land management work. Um, and as you can see from our list here, uh, most importantly are the closures that we've had in some of the larger uh, areas of habitat, let national parks, um, you know, all of North Cascades, for example, has been closed until just two weeks ago, and we were um, allowed to open under the state's phased plan. And so we are, you know, according to the National Park Service's adaptive recovery plan, which is service wide, um, we can uh, base our uh, determinations as local land managers on what the state is doing as well as what you know the president's um, gated criteria and CDC guidelines so I know many of you have already gone through all of those steps as well but um, the good the positive thing for us was being able to try to be in sync with our states as much as possible as the conditions allowed for these openings but it definitely delayed it at least and Jennifer, feel free to jump in here. Um, the field season, and just even able to bring on employees to do those projects. And so we're just now working into that field season in many of the parks that you've seen, not just North Cascades, but Yellowstone, Teton Glacier. Um, but again, you know, there are 419 units in the national park system and various stages of opening, depending on what the local conditions were, but for the most part, as part of a larger plan for uh, taking um, very you know, defined steps on what's appropriate, as long as we can provide for employee health and safety, number one, and then whatever public facing programs, activities we had uh, incorporating uh, those safety guidelines, physical distancing, um, wearing masks, you know, numbers of people being able to, you know, as long as we can assure that, then we can open. But um, that's, Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that piece? Um, all I'll add is, um, you know, we're having with the, the decrease in the number of seasonals available um, for field work and for bear management. Um, and then as well as COVID, we're having to sort of modify some of the bear management activities, especially at Yellowstone and Tetons. And Tetons specifically is experiencing a really high volume of visitation in a really small area. And they've got, um, I don't know if any of you all know of Bear 399, which is this 24 year old sow that uh, wanders along the road corridors in Grand Teton. And she came out with four cubs of the year and has been quite popular uh, with visitors and people are coming far and wide to get a glimpse of her and those four cubs, which is wonderful, but it also creates uh, significant management issues um, and trying to deal with COVID um, and employee safety as well as visitor safety and then safety of the bears. Uh, Tetons had a couple of, of additional items to share. They kind of came in late breaking. Um, apparently there was an adult male grizzly bear broke into a window in an occupied structure in park housing. So that's a first in that park, um, pretty aggressive. I don't know what the outcome of that particular bear was. Um, and then I talked about grizzly bear for, uh, 399 as well. So yeah, I think that's all I've got to add to, to Karen's update. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And then as far as the, uh, the for the National Park Service over in the Pacific West, our, our focus has been on the North Cascades Grizzly Bear Restoration Plan EIS process. And we've been at it for about five years now. 
It's co-led by the National Park Service, which is our funding source, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're the two signatories, but our cooperating agencies are Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and, of course, the U.S. Forest Service all surrounding us. So um, at, we've had two of uh, public comment periods, receiving over 143,000 public comments. Um, at this point, the dis we, that was on our draft environmental impact statement. That, that is still uh, the document um, on the table as the draft, and uh, we are waiting further uh, guidance from the Department of the Interior on that process. Um, other than that, um, I'm not sure, Jennifer, you want to talk about it, the Bear Information System uh, transition at Glacier National Park as another update that we... Uh, it's more that they're, they're just having some uh, growing pains transitioning that system over and they're having to do paper copies of contact reports and um, just having a difficult time with it. But they'll, I think they'll get up to speed on it, but it's just, uh, it's the transition that's been very difficult for them. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And I think it's Mike Philbin has rejoined us. Mike, if you could uh, give us the BLM update. You bet. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on the updates on changes in personnel. Uh, we've made some good progress at filling some key leadership positions. Uh, primarily, our Eastern Montana Dakota's district manager, um, Scott Haight. He'll be covering our Miles City, North Dakota, and South Dakota offices. Um, we have a new permanent field manager in Dillon, um, Amanda James, a couple of acting field managers in Butte and Missoula, and then a new brand chief of biological resources here in the state office in John Carlson. So getting some key leadership positions filled, which we're excited about moving from the parade of actings into actually permanent positions. Um, in terms of the COVID, uh, most employees are back in our offices now. I'd say about 80% are back in the office. Uh, most of the folks who are still out are those folks who have um, just concerns about returning pre-existing conditions, um, some childcare issues if there's not a place for their children to be and they're still trying to line up some of child or elder care, uh, but about 80% are back. Uh, the exception is our Miles City field office. Uh, the BLM Montana Dakota is we're monitoring uh, the situation on a county by county basis based on where our offices are located. Uh, Coast, Custer County had a surge, um, so we retreated in a Miles City office and we backed them off to stage two Montana to stage one. Um, so we are max teleworking out of Miles City again until that situation is resolved. Um, and uh, that's the only office now that is in that situation. Um, our field season is underway now. Um, it was delayed in starting, um, but we now have all our seasonals on board and operations are going forward. Um, fire season is also continuing with fuels treatments and we have quite a few folks down in Arizona right now helping with suppression efforts down in Arizona. Uh, one of the things I just found out about today while I was late to this meeting, uh, we are arranging testing for folks in Montana Dakotas. Uh, we, just, uh, we just procured our first thousand tests and we're looking at doing testing of all employees that want to be tested on a monthly basis. Um, so it'll be for all employees on, you know, on that monthly basis, plus firefighters when they return from assignment will be given a test before they get reassimilated into the Montana Dakotas workforce. Um, so we are taking on that active testing, uh, likely for the next four months or so. Our target is to uh, procure about 5,000 tests or so to cover our employees. Uh, in terms of travel, um, you know, some of the other things were discussed by the other, by our colleagues in the other agencies with uh, folks in vehicles and the like. Um, but our rule on travel is folks are allowed to do non-essential travel to other destinations that are in the same phase as their home office. So with Montana being in its phase two, um, we can travel anywhere in Montana Dakotas that is in that same situation, but they would not be approved to go to Denver or a place that was in a, a phase that isn't quite as advanced as we are. Um, so that's another one of the mitigation measures that we put in place here in Montana Dakotas. Um, to kind of track where employees go. And that applies for non-essential travel. Uh, fire assignments are considered essential. Um, so those folks can go to locations that are not in the same location as Montana. 
And again, as part of the mitigation there, we are gonna be uh, providing testing for those folks upon their return. Uh, and that's all I have for today, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Thanks, David. Uh, so Jim had 45 minutes of prepared remarks, but in the interest of keeping you on your agenda, he's yielded all his time to us. So, uh, so thanks, Jim. So I'll be brief and then I'll turn it over to Hillary to talk a little bit about some of the detailed work her office has been doing since we last met. But um, I, I won't talk a lot about COVID. I think we're in a similar situation as a lot of other folks uh, uh, really prioritizing our field work and minimizing bringing people into offices at this point. But um, just a quick update, when we were together in December, I think I talked to the committee about um, the secretary visiting Eastern Montana and having a town hall meeting to hear about grizzly bear conflicts along the Rocky Mountain front. As a follow-up to that, the service has entered into a, uh, uh, an agreement with Wildlife Services where we're giving them 25,000 a year. Actually, I think I have that number. I can't remember the exact amount, but we're giving them some, some funding every year to allow them to hire some additional uh, conflict specialists to supplement what they currently have on board right now, largely dealing with conflicts with, uh, with grizzly bears and livestock. So uh, that's just a follow on to that conversation that was started uh, in Montana um, back in October. And um, I guess I'll just stop there in the interest of time and turn it over to Hillary to talk about the Section 7 and the five-year status review, as well as specific impacts to her field crews with COVID. So Hillary? Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm waiting for David. I think you got to switch me over. Oh, do you need to take the screen? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I needed to be highlighted. Um, yeah, real quick. I think most people should be aware of this, but in case you're not, uh, ESA requires any federal agency to consider uh, all listed species when they're proposing a project. Um, it's not specific to bears, any listed species. And now that bears uh, more and more are moving outside the, uh, the distributions that we model, we are taking another look at how do we determine when bears may be present. And we're looking at that protocol, trying to make it consistent across the basically grizzly bear range. So Jennifer Fort Norris in my office is heading that up. It has been reviewed by, a draft has been reviewed by partners we're working on the comments and we will hope to have a final protocol later this fall. Um, we are on track with the status review. I think we gave an update um, at the last meeting. So we are cranking along on the biological report. It's actually gonna be a stat species status assessment. Shortly, we'll have it to partners for peer review. Again, that's the, the biological report. It's, it's, it's not the decision or the policy um, or any recommendations, it's the biology. We'll have about 60 days for partner review. And then we will take that and turn that into a status review with a final to be published next March. COVID, like everybody else, yeah, it's, it's really shortened our season. Um, and you can see some of the details there. Any questions for Hillary? Jim, anything additional to add? Okay, um, Claudia, USGS. Um, so like others, we've been effectively, and I would say almost seamlessly teleworking since March. Uh, USGS has taken a very cautious approach to implementing field research um, and um, a lot of effort was put into developing protocols that would allow us to safely get back into the field. Um, so the USGS bear team's field season was delayed in starting, um, but um, they are up and running. They started their annual research captures in mid-June. Um, still working to bring on the full 
um, full team of seasonal field personnel. And the expectation is that we'll resume our full schedule by early July. Um, we, in coordination with some agency, with, with all of our agency partners, the uh, BEAR study team reduced our aerial survey schedule. Um, and, um, and our BEAR um, research team is, is continuing with their ongoing analyses. They're working on enhancements to the population monitoring program. Um, all of that work is proceeding as planned and it will be reported at the fall meeting of the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee. Um, and then I guess, you know, the other, the other comment regarding COVID is that there are actually some potentially important avenues of research emerging as a result of COVID. And so our, our team um, um, is assessing the potential uh, for pursuing um, some of those research lines and um, um, Perhaps at a, at a later meeting, we might have more progress on that and can give you more of an update there. That's it for us. Great, thanks, Claudia. So um, we are, you'll, you've noticed we're a little bit behind schedule, um, but I think that these subcommittee updates can go faster than we had planned. Um, the, in the normal course of events for IGBC, the big report outs from the subcommittees are at the winter meeting. So this is really just a check-in. Um, so if I could ask the subcommittee chairs to move quickly, we've got the slides that will be available um, uh, after this meeting um, online. So if, in case you missed anything, but let's start. Um, I see Chuck is ready to go. Uh, Bitterroot Ecosystem. Um, David. Yes. I, I'm interrupt really quickly. I know we're on a tight time frame, but I would like to wrap up um, the. Uh, what I heard, I think I heard everyone say, and that's just a, a full recognition of the changed operating environment we are all under because of COVID. And so on one hand, we have what I'm hearing is um, a decreased number of seasonals, a shorter season, um, potential budget impacts. We're all addressing re remote work while on the, um, other hand, we're seeing increased recreational use, increased conflicts, and also bear activity in expanded areas. So I just want to just wrap that up, that, that those were themes that I heard everybody present. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Um, okay, so into the subcommittee reports then. Um, Chuck. Okay. Thanks, David. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chuck Mark. I'm the Beartooth Ecosystem, uh, or Beartooth, Bitterroot Ecosystem Subcommittee Chairman, and also the Forest Supervisor on the Salmon Chalice National Forest. So a couple uh, couple updates. One is, is uh, we've met a couple times, once face-to-face -face, uh, in Missoula back in January, and then uh, here most recently, a couple weeks ago, on, uh, on a Teams meeting, uh, the Fish and, <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service, uh, regions one and in, in four of the Forest Service in the states of Montana and Idaho uh, that have influence and uh, certainly interest in the Bitterroot ecosystem. And the reason for doing that was really to just get us on the same page uh, on the Fed side. Um, we learned, uh, learned uh, about the history um, you know, it goes all the way back 20 years now at, at a minimum in regards to uh, trying to uh, recover grizzly bears in the Bitterroot ecosystem and also uh, determine some actions moving forward uh, with having learned some about that history uh, on the Forest Service side and in, uh, in the Fish and Wildlife Service. Some of the things that, that we identified back in January as far as needs, uh, one of those, and, and I'll touch on this a little bit more, is a, is a uh, overall comprehensive communication plan on where we've been, how we got to today and where we're going. Uh, we've also uh, feel the need to uh, re-examine the recovery plan. Recovery plan is, if I, hopefully I've got this right, 1993 vintage. And obviously things have changed over the last 27 some odd years, especially in and around the Bitterroot. So um, need for relocation sites. And we've talked about this certainly within our subcommittee and probably some of the other ecosystems. Uh, we have definitely got a need for short-term and long-term, you know, these bears that are moving from other areas 
uh, into and towards the Bitterroot. Um, you know, the next bear is just around the corner that's going to show up and uh, not necessarily be in trouble, but it's going to be, okay, what now? And, uh, and we certainly need to have some strategies. And I know we're starting to have those conversations, but I think myself and some others uh, feel more of a sense of urgency in regards to that, especially for some short-term places to put bears to uh, maybe keep them out of trouble. Um, we've also uh, talked about uh, taking a look again at the current recovery zone boundary. And uh, if that needs you know, any tweaking, and then also, uh, you know, connectivity. What are the ways that bears are getting into the Bitterroot? Um, you know, they're coming in from the north. Um, you know, you heard Toby a little bit earlier talking about, uh, you know, the Grangeville, uh, Grangeville bears. And uh, second, second-hand information I've got, you know, we've got bears, you know, as we speak over in the big hole, just east of us. Um, so. Um, you know, what, uh, you know, identifying those connectivity areas and how we would manage those and how we would work with the local communities in regarding to those connectivity areas that'd be so important for recovery of the grizzly bear in the Bitterroot ecosystem is, is really an important, important arena of uh, discussion and, and decision making. Uh, we also identified signing protocols in regards to these expanding bear populations. I know. Cheryl Probert, forest supervisor up in Nesper Squarewater, earlier this spring was looking at a forest-wide uh, uh, sanitation order and uh, food storage. And, and, uh, and I know, uh, and this is neither good nor bad, Idaho Fish and Game has been working with some of the other forests up in North Idaho and over here in the Caribou Targhee and how we do that. And so I think we've got some work to do there, uh, especially within the Bitterroot and uh, you know, just coming up with some standard protocols and, and how we approach, you know, uh, you know, we'll say food storage sanitation orders uh, and how we, uh, uh, you know, how we measure the, you know, where do we put those in regards to the expanding bear population? Because it's not as straightforward as, uh, as you might think it might be. Um, certainly coordination with, uh, with tribal partners is still, a, is still a real need. And then uh, uh, we also, I think we just touched upon, some folks touched upon consultation. Uh, we need some consistent We'll say analysis units, you know, within the uh, Bitterroot ecosystem with regards to consultation, which we don't really have identified at this point. And then some training for our Section 7 consultation biologists, you know, in the Forest Service. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these biologists, you know, I can speak for a couple of mine, just have not dealt with grizzly bears before. And so I think that would be a, that would be an important forum uh, to have. Um, and then uh, talking to the communication plan, really, and we spent some time on this, and we're looking to have a draft for our next virtual session towards the end of July. But uh, you know, we want to we want to identify, you know, bring folks, you know, and I'll say the larger community and the communities in and around the Bitterroot ecosystem up to speed with, you know, how do you know what is the status of the grizzly bear today, and how did we get here, you know, within the Bitterroot ecosystem, and then identify, you know. Uh, certainly some short-term actions, you know, moving forward, you know, we've talked about these before in regards to bearware education, food storage and sanitation, you know, the identification of relocation sites and then connect connectivity areas just for starters. And, uh, and so that is really important, I think, in regards to setting up, you know, a good foundation for the recovery of the grizzly bear into the future here in the Bitterroot bitter ecosystem. Then we also want to develop some core messages that we want to be able to share externally too in what we're doing here in the Bitterroot ecosystem. It isn't a matter of, you know, we're just sitting here waiting for bears to show up and then we're going to react. I think we want to be as proactive as possible in anticipation. In fact, it isn't even anticipation. We know we've got bears in the Bitterroot ecosystem moving in and out. And it's okay, how are we going to live with bears? How are we going to recover the bear? And, uh, you know, how we're going to move forward with the, uh, I'll say, some of the more unique issues that are in this Bitterroot ecosystem with grizzly bear recovery. And then last, you know, having some focused action, short, you know, mid-range, medium, and long-term in regards to, uh, in regards to the, the communication plan and, and the priorities moving forward with talking about and implementing grizzly bear recovery in the Bitterroot ecosystem. Uh, last item I had was uh, we had also identified a need for, for uh, developing a subcommittee, uh, science, uh, science committee, uh, science team for the, to support the Bitterroot Ecosystem Subcommittee. And we just had our inaugural uh, call here uh, a little over a week ago. And so uh, I, think that's, I think that's pretty exciting. And 
And uh, I certainly want to thank Jennifer Fortin Norris for, for helping uh, help me instigate that. And so we're uh, we're off and running. Uh, you know, not, not a lot going on yet, but uh, at least we've got a committee identified and, and, uh, and at least some preliminary uh, action item for, for that committee. Great. And I think the last last thing I'll touch on in regards to COVID is even though so much has been talked about to me, especially where I've been spending all my time as a forest supervisor, it's all about recreation and fire management. Um, you know, that is where we're spending our time and that's where we're probably going to spend our time for the rest of the summer. Uh, I think that's guaranteed, you know, especially with, you know, the strength of the wildland fire fire organization is in moving resources to the greatest places of need. Well, obviously that is present, presents some predicaments and some complexities with uh, the way the, you know, in regards to the COVID-19 and uh, the coronavirus. And then certainly recreation has been, uh, has been challenging uh, just uh, as a, uh, Matter of discussion, you know, I've got uh, you know, middle forks and main forks of the salmon, in which you know we uh, we launch seven boats down the down each river a day, you know, and uh, that's presented some complexities with trying to work out protocols and standard operating procedures in regards to sanitation, cleanliness, social distancing, etc., with uh, with the outfitting community. So, uh, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. I think each. And, each Forest here in southern Idaho is get, you know, in fact, every forest probably here in Idaho has got something unique in the recreation arena that's challenging them in regards to uh, recreation use in the virus, and it's only going to get more exciting, uh, I'm afraid. So, I think that's it for me. End of report, David. Very good. Very good. So, for the North Cascade, oops, let me get suddenly developed an echo. Um, Kristen Bale from the Forest Service, I think I see you uh, on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen mentioned that you were stepping in as chair here for this subcommittee. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Yes, um, I became the forest supervisor uh, last September and um, I was um, very honored um, to be able to follow behind Karen's footsteps after serving for so many years. Um, there's been some good information that uh, has already been shared that um, applies to um, our um, eco North Cascade ecosystem, um, in particular, um, Eric Johnson's discussion of um, litigation, um, you know, the, uh, the mentions of um, impacts from, from COVID-19. Um, Karen Taylor Goodrich gave a good update on the um, status of the EIS for, for recovery. Um, I do want to share that we have a new forest supervisor for the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. Um, her name is Jody Wheel. She comes to us from the Bureau of Land Management. Um, she started uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but one of the things that uh, um, we're going to have her um, get, get briefed on is um, the Mount Baker Snoqualmie is, is considering um, instituting a forest-wide food storage order. So um, that is a potential um, development that might be coming. Um, the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest is still still a bit behind the Mount Baker Snoqualmie. We're um, shoring up um, our Forest Service owned um, um, bear, bear proof receptacles and then also having to do some switching um, with um, local providers moving from um, rear loading to front loading um, trash trash trucks. Um, we're having to switch, switch things around and change over because they only have the one trash truck and um, we have to change. They're not they're not going to change. So um, some work going on there. Um, our science um, technical team, um, we've asked, the, the subcommittee has asked the team to, to look at options because we realize that um, some of our key habitat information, um, particularly roads and high, high use trails, um, that information is, is um, a bit out of date. And so, you know, understanding what the collective effort among the different land owning, um, land managing agencies, what it would take to um, have an improvement in that. And um, the Defenders of Wildlife is also doing doing some work through some contract um, contracting that they're doing this year. So working to um, get, get better data um, and information. Um, we held our annual spring subcommittee meeting. We did it by telephone um, this last June 9th. It's a, um, so it says May, but it was actually June 9th. And it was um, very successful. And we did have um, public involvement and comments shared. Um, we are also experiencing the very high level of visitation that other folks have uh, reflected on. 
Um, and um, right now we could have a, a relatively um, robust fire season, at least on the eastern side of, of the Cascade Mountains. So, so all, all of that, um, you know, is, is um, you know, increasing disturbance in, in um, you know, potential habitat areas. So uh, I think that covers our, our main items because everyone else has done a really good job of, of talking about the COVID-19 situation. We're, we're very similar, very, uh, still mostly closed, a lot of variability in the different counties and um, some impacts on our summer, summer workload and um, temporary workforce. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, Kristen. So for um, Selkirk, Cabinet Yak, NCDE, and YES, we have the um, conflict reduction work uh, reports that your subcommittees have done on the agenda later this afternoon. So again, if we, if we can try to just summarize the things that are new uh, and specific to your subcommittee um, so to try to catch us back up a little bit. But Rodney Smolden. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me okay, David? Sure can. All right. I'll make it quick. Uh, all the COVID related items are the same, less time, less employees, less information down the road. Um, Non-COVID related, um, the uh, Selkirk Cabinet Yak was able to uh, scrounge up about 15 trail cameras to provide to the British, British Columbia effort, uh, population estimate effort that they have underway. They're in year one uh, of a two year uh, field study uh, followed by another year of analysis. So uh, we're a few years out to get a better handle on what that population estimate is on the British, British Columbia side of, of the Selkirks. Um, staying with the Selkirks, uh, there's been four mortalities in the Selkirks, uh, two in British Columbia, two in the US. The two in British Columbia are uh, still under investigation and they were two adult females. Um, there was one sub-adult sub male in the U.S. Under, also under investigation, and then um, a sub-adult female um, that, that uh, we lost with a, a vehicle collision. Uh, no mortalities that we know in the cabinet yaks to date. Um, the committee was able to meet, uh, subcommittee was able to meet in an abbreviated um, fashion here just a couple months ago. Um, our efforts, uh, Randy and I were working together to get the Northern Continental Divide subcommittee together with us. Uh, we had a time, we had a date, we had a place, and then uh, our lives were disrupted like everybody else's. So still looking forward to being able to connect with uh, NCDE at some future date. End of report. Thanks, Rodney. Randy Arnold. Yeah, good afternoon, Randy Arnold. I'm the Regional Supervisor for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and currently the Chair of the NCDE. And yes, we had a, Rodney and I had a great uh, spring uh, co-meeting planned between the NCDE and the Selkirk Cabinet Yak place uh, and everything all worked out, social hour all figured out. But we did move to a, a virtual platform on May 29th for our NCDE meeting. And um, because it was a little later than normal, we had an opportunity to pull our conflict specialists together. We normally we get those reports from them in the, in the fall. And they were um, almost all reporting higher conflicts than normal in a lot of places. We had a number of depredations. Um, we did euthanize a number of bears and relocate bears. A lot of variable um, issues there, depending on which side of the NCDE you're under. Um, and the, um, Last piece on the NCDE regarding some administrative updates. Um, the conservation strategies has been completed for a while, but we did put together a process to keep up those necessary changes to the conservation strategies as they bump up. And I think we finalized the last of some issues about managing um, AUMs and uh, comparing apples to apples um, on some of the reporting requirements. And then um, outside of that, a lot of conversation around our mortality, uh, but I think uh, Hillary and that conversation should pick up most of those details, David. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Trisha O'Connor. Sorry, uh, the unmute was not working. Uh, can you hear me? Sure Good? can. Okay, great. Um, so pretty quickly from the, um, uh, so again, I'm Trisha O'Connor, for those that don't know me, um, chair of the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee, also for supervisor 
for the Bridger Teton National Forest out of Jackson, Wyoming. Um, so updates for yes, due to COVID, we did also have to opt to have a virtual meeting back in April. Um, I think we were one of the first ones to put our toes in the water on it and really weren't sure how it would go, but I believe in the end it was pretty successful. We focused on really just information sharing um, and uh, one of the feedback, we had quite a bit of public engagement or at least listening in on it. Uh, at times, I think, David, upwards of 100 people were kind of following us and listening. And I think what I would just say as a learning from it, um, you know, definitely the, the downside was the lack of us being able to do engagement. But the plus side was we got comments from people who have never been able to attend our meetings because of travel. So, you know, something to think about in the future of how we engage broader audiences. Um, due to the nature of that, we weren't able to um, dive into the substantive work around uh, conflict reduction. As I reported in uh, the December IGBC meeting, that was our plan, is we needed to fine tune our priorities and really focus on what is it we could do as next steps, where are our partners do we get partners involved and what are some concrete things? And we just weren't able to do it. So we did opt to have a, we've got a tech team that's gonna help us focus or you know do some work, pre-work before our fall meeting to help focus. And then I'm also very interested to see what IGBC, um, sort of what comes out of this meeting um, in terms of higher level issues that we might be able to let go of and we could focus on some uh, a smaller subset of that. So looking forward to that. And then the only other thing I would mention um, is that we also are working on the conservation strategy edits uh, updates that are focused on developed sites and allowing flexibility within the footprints that are already non core, uh, non secure habitat uh, to, to because of the increasing demand and recreation. So we're still working on that. Hope to get that out to the public sometime uh, in the near future. And then we did have the, um, not sure the process of this, but we do have our charter. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Woolley. We have our charter ready to be approved. Yes, has approved it for your consideration and uh, it's just ready for that. So Tim, I guess, take it away. Got it, and really the last part of that charter as you remember in December, I kind of presented the key points of the YES charter um, was to get with Chris Smith and he was kind enough to look through, made some very simple edits when you get into the subcommittee section, adding a sentence that the YES committee would retain their charter. And then what I did is I appended to the appendix um, in its entirety. And so I think with that little bit of language that would give the opportunity of other subcommittees doing the same, because those were some of the discussions we had and um, put the charter in the, in the uh, appendix. And really the key things with the yes um, charter is, is really defining voting. And that was something that back at Chico Hot Springs when the yes committee got together and had shifted to the, to the um, uh, YGCC, they had had to develop their own charter. So we made sure we maintained those specifics so that that would uh, meet what they wanted to do. So really that's all it is. I sent it out and no changes to IGBC. It was just a matter of how to fit the two together, and I think it's ready to go. Yeah. So this was on this was on the agenda as a, a decisional item, and as Tim just described, you know, this was presented and discussed in December. So I guess I would ask if there's any questions for Tim uh, or any concerns. You know, anyone who's who's not able to. Uh, approve that charter change uh, at this time. Okay. So we'll, we'll take that um, and, and, and update that in the places that we, we've got that, that document published. And that completes the updates. Uh, thanks to all for sharing. What I think this accomplished is it just shows the you know, this is a group of, of equals. Everyone has got major programs um, and investments and, and responsibilities to the public. Um, and you know, we're dealing with similar, but, but, but slightly different things based on our geographies. Um, and so this is an important forum to come together and, and look for those commonalities. So we have um, 
About a third of the time that we had planned for now remaining before our break, which we are going to hold at 2.45 regardless. So 2.45, we're taking that break. Um, so we, the next thing up is to get into some business items. And what we have today on these business items really was more informational, um, although decisions are gonna be needed likely at your July call. Um, so uh, Chris Savage, if you're on the line, um, could you maybe walk us through, and again, we've, we've, got much, we've got less time than we'd anticipated, but we've got sort of this filling the executive coordinator, which is currently vacant. We've got the question of putting the agency agreements in place for FY21. Um, you know, those, those agreements get done every year around this time. And then um, some proposed changes to the work plan for the um, Wildlife Management Institute um, and, and that, that Lori Roberts is gonna walk us through. So Chris, uh, take it away. Okay, thanks Dave. And I'll definitely defer to Martha or Jackie as well uh, from some of the discussions that we've had um, leading up to this. So I think in the um, pre-work that Martha sent out to the, to the committee, it's the briefing for summer meeting um, there's a good summary of the background of how the, the executive coordinator position has been funded and who funds the position. Um, and so typically, the, uh, we gather about $185,000 in, in the northern region here. Half of that money goes to the salary and the benefits of the position, a little bit both for training, travel, and then uh, the conference rooms and, and so forth. And then the remainder of that, almost half of that goes into the information education and outreach grants. Uh, the way that that's broken out in this table was what was how that those grants were funded this past year. Um, it varies depending on the uh, what uh, project submittals come in, whether, you know, compared, to, you know, the, the varying between whether we get uh, non-government agency projects that get funded compared to agency projects. And so we rely on WMI to transfer the money um, through, those, through those challenge cost share as a third party. And so sometimes those are higher, sometimes those are lower, but we don't, tip, you know, it's so it varies. You don't always see $50,000 going to WMI. Um, and so this past year, as everyone knew, um, Ellen Davis retired during pretty much really close to the last meeting that we had back here in Missoula. Um, and so uh, we used, uh, so she had been about a 0.8 of an FTE, uh, give or take. And then, um, so with uh, her retirement at the end of the year, her salary and a little lump sum uh, we ended up spending about $26,000, $27,000. And so right now we have about $64,000 remaining um, that we have not spent yet. And I also think that we're still uh, waiting for one of the Fish and Wildlife Services to make, their, make this year's contribution. So that value would go up. I think it's the Mountain Prairie region. And so um, with the discussions that we've been having with the executive coordinator position, I think you captured those well in the, in the discussion questions. You know, basically I think what we end up doing with the executive coordinator position and where we end up kind of will dictate what we can do with the, the remaining funds that we have this year. Um, we can, all, you know, if we don't get a position filled uh, by the end of this fiscal year, you know, we do have some options that we can look at. Uh, that we'll need to make decisions on here pretty quick. Those would include, we could de-obligate the funds and send them back out to the different entities uh, so that you could still try to spend them this year. Um, the way that the agreements are set up, they are a reimbursable agreement. So um, we don't, uh, we don't um, bill until those, until those expenditures have been spent. And so, um, so that's why they could easily be deobligated. Uh, typically, we have about three years to spend the money, so we could hold on to the money um, and carry that money over next year. So there would be less of a contribution that the that the agencies would have to make, um, or we could use that money else, or or we could look at a bigger pot. Say, you know, we could look at, you know, do you want a larger uh, information and education program for next year? 
and use some of that money. So we do have some opportunities uh, to decide what we want to do with the savings that we've had um, without filling the position uh, this year. So some of the discussions that we still have been ongoing with is, you know, how do we fill the executive coordinator position? Uh, so, the, you know, building off the discussions that we had when we were in Missoula last year, you know, we did want to try, you know, and even previous to that, going back even to the, uh, to the, uh, the retreat that we had up at Sealy Lake and considering, you know, do we want somebody more than just a coordinator? Um, do we want somebody that has is helping developing the agenda, kind of uh, working closely with the the executive committee, um, working closely with the the uh, the steering teams, the um, the I and E group, and kind of helping move forward some of these things that we were, we identified back during the um, the retreat, uh, and have that person kind of be the kind of be the, the, the go-to person or the, you know, the one that's steering the efforts. And so that's what we've been trying here with David and definitely appreciate David's help these last six months, same with uh, Jennifer Carpenter and allowing us to tap David's skills and abilities to kind of get us to, to this meeting. And so those, those discussion questions, I think, you know, that's where, you know, we're, what we're still mulling around, honestly, and I'm sorry I didn't, we didn't have a proposal set up by uh, for this meeting, but I think uh, we do want to have some either some further discussions today or at least a decision by July so that we can move forward and fill the position because I think um, from all the discussions, everyone does see the urgency and the need of the position is just, you know, some of these additional questions we need to kind of finalize. Um, and so I think once we know what we want to do, the executive coordinator, you know, because there could be some additional costs if we go with a higher graded position, you know, Ellen was a GS 11. Uh, we are looking at either a GS 12 or GS 13 possibly, um, and whether that should be full time or um, back to a, you know, more of a permanent part time schedule that Ellen was on. If you go at the highest end with a GS 13. Um, full time, it would be about an additional $40,000 uh, to the uh, con uh, to the program. And so that, you know, with, I think what I counted to be about additional, um, I think eight or this, yeah, about $8,000 per contribution. Um, so I think those are some of the discussions. I don't know if we were able to leave time to have some of those discussions now, David, I think I'll defer to Martha. Uh, to maybe also fill in some, uh, maybe some things that I missed or some other conversations that she may have had or, or others may have had as well. But I do think that, you know, once we get all this figured out, I think all this will come into play. You know, once we know what the, we'll know what the, the budget will be going into 21 by knowing what, how much money we need for the coordinator position and then what we want to do with the savings. And then I think from there, then I think then you've got a person in place that can really start having the discussions of what do we want to do with the WMI work plan moving, moving into the future. So that, that'd be my summary, David. Okay, and I am also looking to Martha. Um, we are gonna take our break, uh, but Chris, I guess I'm thinking, I'm looking for the path forward. So you're, this group is gonna be back on the call at the end of July. Is there a need for a, 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 some volunteers here today to, to work with you and Martha and Jackie, um, you know, to give you give some bring some options to this group for decision uh, by that July twenty fourth date. You know, here's the, here's what we're going to move forward to, for with in terms of the package on the coordinator. Here's some options for lapsed dollars and, and how to use those, um, and you know, then be ready to put the agreements for FY twenty one in place. So David, um, what I'm wondering um, to tee up what those next steps and options would be, and maybe we, I throw this out there and then everyone takes a break. It seems to me the decision on the executive coordinator is different um, or is the precursor to the fiscal year 21 budget. And so I, I'm wondering just to throw out there, would, is there an appetite to um, actually make a decision on um, where we want to house the executive coordinator 
uh, what that might look like today so that that small a smaller committee of people could present the options um, for the budget at the next meeting for us to take action on. Because it seems to me where we're going with the executive coordinator is a critical piece to be able to build that budget. It's something you're gonna need to know first. So I think um, to take a break, but when we get back, whether people have the appetite or desire to, um, to make a decision on where the executive coordinator will be housed and what that position would look like. And I don't wanna push everyone, but if we could do that, I think it would be nice to get it um, moving and off our plate so we can then fo focus on the budget. Okay, so we'll try to do that on the other side of the break. Um, Lori, um, what I'm thinking is that your IEO recommendations on criteria, we, we'll, we'll push those into your update, is that okay? Uh, so, we'll, so we'll circle back to the slides that you had prepared on the, on the proposals to shift um, some dollars to, from printing materials to some other, other IEO activities. That can be part of your, your update. And so that means we are on a break uh, and we will return at three o'clock on the dot. So um, thanks everyone. You can uh, just leave, you can stay signed into the Zoom and just mute your camera and your, um, uh, your, your video and your audio. And that way you can just pick it back up at, when, we, when we start again.
Hey, Mary. Hey, Jackie, can you hear me? We, I can hear you loud and clear. So Alrighty. you're on. Yeah, so I can't see my video at all. Oh, I can. Well, you, I can see you. Well, that's I nice. I can see your head. <laughs> yeah, so I can't. So that, oh, uh, hey, there's you. Yes, but I, I can't can see, see me, so I can't even. I can see your knee right now. I can see your your oh. scar, <laughs> Mary. That's <laughs> gross. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whoa! Back away from the scar. <laughs> Come on, Mary. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to do this here. <laughs> I'm helping. I'm coaching from afar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now what can you see? Um, your your key your keyboard, your computer. Yeah. So I flip the darn photo thing. There you go. I see your face. We see you. Okay. I can't, so I don't know if I'm balanced. <laughs> your perfect headshot. Is that okay? Yeah. You can't that's see that my nose, can you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> so we got you. Yay! It works. Okay. And they're coming back. Yeah, I think we have like two minutes. So okay, I'll chill until then. But uh, okay. know that I'm here. But it would David. So Mary's on, and it would be good to have your voice. You know, hear hear your thoughts around stuff too, Mary. Yeah, I'll weigh in. I'll weigh okay. in. All right. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thanks a bunch. Yep. Danielle, I think you were on just before the break, but we have a, a we're, we're not going to start right in with your summit report. We've got a couple of things to finish from the last business item topic, okay? Okay. Okay, folks, it's three o'clock. Uh, we have a lot left on this agenda today. Um, some really uh, important reports from um, the information education outreach and conflict reduction and from other things as well. So I, uh, I see cameras still turned off. Um, if we're gonna jump right back into this and as we, where we were at the break uh, was we were recognizing that we have some significant uh, business items to attend to um, but not necessarily some uh, executable options on the table here for the executives. So maybe I'll ask Martha um, if you've got a thought, you had sort of put the question on the table, could the group decide today on the coordinator options and then that, and then have a small group come forward with a plan for, or, or some options for resulting FY21 budgets. Um, I get, is, is, that, is that a good summary of your proposal? I don't see uh, that, you back yet. That's a good summary. And I realize that's um, a little bit out of the blue, but I, um, so I'd like to hear from others. It was, it's, it's a um, honest question. It, it, does anyone have concerns with that proposal? Martha, I'd say let's let's strike while the iron's hot and try and see if we can get to a decision. I agree. Okay. So to be to clarify, then the proposal would be to move forward with um, housing the executive coordinator with the Forest Service, having it be, is it a GS 13? 
um, to develop a position description and get the um, um, get it out there to hire. And then I guess the question there would be, I know we, I believe last time we uh, already established a team or people who were interested in that hiring process. Um, so, hey, Martha, this is yeah. Jackie. So I, I, I want to really be sure that folks going from the 11 till the 12, 13, and I think Ellen was part-time, right? Not, was she full-time? She's part-time. We're, we're she was about, she charged about 80%. So, so going to a full-time 12, 13, I, I think we could be edging up closer to 10,000 or I don't know, maybe it's eight, somewhere between eight and 10, because we're going to, we would go to a full-time 12 or 13. If We're looking for a full-time position, I guess, one, clarifying. Is that correct, Chris, Martha? Yeah. Yeah. In my estimates, um, if you did full time GS thirteen, there would be an extra forty thousand, and then twenty six thousand for GS twelve um, at the full time schedule. So Ellen, Ellen's cost was a little higher because she she was stepped out, and and so so gotcha. similar, so about five thousand extra per contribution for a twelve for a thirteen. Okay, well, although you know you could get. You actually could get a 13 that applied for it that was stepped out too that could cost you on that high end because you can't mm -hmm. you don't know who you're going to get so i just i want to be sure and and the reason i'm i'm saying on the money um the states we heard wyoming say they're looking at a 20 percent you know cut and i think a lot of the states are looking you know to um well a lot of us are looking to tighten our belts so Sometimes it's felt a little hard to even get the money that we committed to. So really want to be sure that folks, if we agree to this, that it's agreeing to that understanding of it is more money um, that, that will be expected. So that's a change, uh, or that's just one thing to clarify. So it's, you know, our, with, the, with the 11 to the 12 or 13, um, for sure, uh, just, I don't know, Martha, that it didn't feel like we asked that question clear enough or we got consensus from everybody because that's a big thing to move forward to. That's a long term commitment. Um, and we all know that we're struggling a bit with money. So and this is Mike Philbin. This seems a little backwards to me. Yeah. It seems like we should be identifying the duties first mm -hmm. and then identifying what type of employee we need to carry out those duties. So this is Jennifer. Um, I believe we had a uh, this discussion or similar discussion at the December meeting, wanting to understand whether we wanted to increase the, the scope of duties beyond um, what Ellen did uh, to you know, encompass maybe more of um, you know, information and ed education outreach as part of the job description. And then I shared a, a PD with a couple of folks from the GYCC coordinator position that David Diamond is in. Um, to sort of use that as a, just a, an example um, of a multi-agency coordinator position that is a GS-13, but I totally agree um, that I feel like we, we need to define the scope of the duties before yeah. we go forward and say it's gonna be this grade or that grade. So Martha, uh, this is Mary Farnsworth and I've been struggling to get on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes, loud and clear, Mary. Okay, so, so apologize for the technical difficulties there. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, so I, I'm supportive of filling the position, but I'm very concerned about the grade uh, for all the reasons that Jackie and, and others have spoken about. And as I see uh, the states having some budget challenges and talking about furloughing employees and all these sorts of things. And uh, I also agree with defining the duties and defining them to be what we can afford um, and, and that back and forth dialogue. So from my perspective, it might be a little bit of a rush to decide today, um, but I'm very concerned about just saying, oh yeah, let's make it a 13. Uh, I think region four would have uh, a challenge of ponying up any extra cash. We're challenged right now. Um, and as Jackie said, uh, struggling with even the amount that we're putting in these days. Um, increasing duties from some of the subcommittees like the INE and the work that uh, 
uh, that those committees do is critically important work, critical, but I'm not sure we need a coordinator to coordinate that more than we're coordinating it now. Um, I'm not sure we can afford it. And so I think we need to put our uh, not so rose colored glasses on from our financial perspective and really dial up the duties that are really necessary this year as we go through this challenging time. End of report. I think- a Couple, sorry, Martha. Go ahead, Matt. So just a reminder, the, the states don't pay dues, so it's just on the federal agencies. So, um, so point still taken about federal agencies, but states have historically not paid dues into the IGPC. Uh, we did, we did have this conversation. Well, I don't disagree that um, we need to look at the scope of the responsibilities. We had a conversation when we were together in December and there was general consensus that we wanted more out of an executive coordinator than we've had historically based on the grade. We didn't necessarily settle on a 13 versus a 14 versus a 12, but I think at least back six months ago, everyone was, uh, supportive, as I recall, of bringing a little bit more capacity to the table in terms of the executive coordinator. Speaking as a former chair, it would be helpful and now others who have been chairs can chime in like Jim. Um, it, I, I think it'd be helpful to have someone who can think about what are some of the issues we should be talking about and not just what hotel we're going to stay in and, and how our meals are going to be planned. and. And just because frankly, uh, everyone's busy and we've relied on uh, kind of a makeshift approach to do that in the past from the advisors to the chair, to the vice chair, to others. And uh, there, there seemed to be a general consensus that yeah, we could, we could use a bit more horsepower there in that position. I'm not, a lot has changed in six months, right? I mean, it's a whole different world than it was in December, but um, just reminding folks that we did talk about some of this before. I, yes, thank you, Matt. And I would love to hear from you, Jim, too. You know, I, I want to apologize. I came into this conversation thinking we had talked about this um, and that it reflected where we see the IGBC going, and that is um, being more of a collective body, it sort of goes into your proposal, even Toby, um, we're, I think we are asking um, the IGBC to um, provide more guidance and step up to be, to coordinate efforts that had traditionally happened mostly within the subcommittees. Um, so anyway, I didn't mean, I, I threw that out there and that if we could address this and move on, it would be worth doing rather than deliberating on something we didn't need to. But it sounds like uh, I'm not sure about that. And I was making uh, some assumptions that that was work we'd already done and had already gotten there. So Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, my thought, or I, I was feeling the same way you were, Martha. I thought we had made kind of the decision that we wanted to have a little bit more responsibility in the position. Um, it makes sense to me now that we're moving from population recovery to population management. And I think I just saw Toby's um, ideas, proposals here the other day. And a lot of those things make a lot of sense to me as we see populations increasing um, the lines blurring between ecosystems. I think that um, more coordination and, and uh, maybe a higher level attention to the position would be very useful. And I totally support it, just the money thing. And I apologize because I missed that meeting. I was in DC for the winter, but I just want to be clear on the money. It, it, you know, if folks agree to it, then you know we agree, but that comes with that expectation of the additional money. So that's my, if everyone's good or, but it sounds like we still have, you know, maybe Mary has some questions on that. Yeah, and I agree that we, um, we decided we wanted more out of the position, but we never put any meat on the bones. I think we need to talk specifically what the expectations would be for the position and start getting into the details. And I have not heard any subsequent discussions to that December meeting. Uh, this is Jennifer, I agree with that. And that that's sort of why I sent out that 
PD as a place to start. Um, and I don't think that, you know, life happens and we didn't get any further with it, at least to my knowledge. Um, but looking at a broader scope of activities that the coordinator could do at a little bit higher grade uh, was, you know, I agree with you, Martha, that's where we ended up, but I don't know if we decided on exactly what that looked like specifically. Well, so how about this in the interest of time today? Um, are there those who want to um, be on a committee to bring forward a proposal, a, p a position description, an, ex an explanation of the duties, and, um, and a proposal that we could act on, on at the July meeting? Say, get it to everybody the beginning of July, and, um, and we have something before us for our July meeting. I, I really worry about waiting much past that. Um, David has been fabulous. I couldn't have, I couldn't have done this without um, his help. And I think it, I, I think it's important for the for the IGBC moving forward. And Martha, I'll, I'll put my vote in with you for that, because one of the things we also talked about is just missed opportunity if we don't um, get into the hiring phase now, like on the Forest Service side, we have budget reform coming and, and a, a different process in fiscal 20, year 21. And so it, there's some drivers that would make it really um, important and easier if we could move out on this, you know, sooner rather than later. And we talked about that with Chris. Uh, Savage and the folks in Region 1. So, um, Michael and Jennifer, would you be willing to help us with that? Uh, yeah, I can help you with that. I will caveat it with I'm very new to the IGBC and therefore don't know everything that that the committee does you know i don't have a long history with the committee is what i'm saying and um want to make sure that i'm being guided with somebody who's very familiar with the committee and what it needs and that we set a vision about what we want this coordinator to do in a very broad sense because i think we can take advantage of a higher grade and an increased scope of duties and really um, you know, expand the services um, that we can provide as a committee, but I don't necessarily have the expertise being so new to the committee to take it on sort of myself, if you will. Happy to help in any way, and that's why I, um, you know, sent out that PD for consideration as just sort of a stepping stone to, to start. Um, but yes, absolutely happy to help. And that was very well said. I'm in the same boat. Okay. And I, I would draw on Matt or Jim, and I know Laurie, you have a stake in this in some respects too. Any anybody else who wants to be part of this? Yeah, count me and Martha. I'll help. Great. Martha, I can help. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, Hillary will be probably working closer than anyone with this person in position, so she may have the most insight. And I'd say, Martha, this is Scott. I, as the former supervisor of that position, I guess from the Forest Service, if it's going to be a Forest Service position, but you know, I did supervise that for ten years, and I, you know, from a background perspective, I'd be glad to to help with that too. Well, and you still might be supervising it, or Chris Savage, but yeah, there's. Definitely important for the Forest Service, for yeah. one of you guys. Okay. So to be clear, um, it sounded like Jim, Matt, Mike, uh, Jennifer, Hillary, Scott. And I do I have everyone? I'm you know I'm interested in helping and Jackie. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say count me in for sure. I'd, I'd be happy. Yeah, and we'll have a let's have a follow up call and we can go through the duties and um, work through a proposal for the actually get information to everyone in June in early July and, and have a proposal for the July meeting.
and Chris, I'm sure we'll be working with you as well. Yeah, definitely. I got those names too. Now I'll put together the information I collected today on the duties, differences between the PDs that I found, the one that Jennifer sent out, so you can kind of get a sense of what the responsibilities are between the different grades. Great. So I think in some respects, we're largely there. Just um, we need to, as, as others have said, put the cart before the horse. No, put the horse before the cart. <laughs> So this is Eric. I have a I have a, just a thought here, and it doesn't change. I think we got a good plan moving forward, but it occurs to me, you know, we've landed on having this be a federal position, and I think again we start with what we we want this to be in the duties. I also wonder if we would consider doing something uh, like under contract or agreement um, <clears throat> with an outside, you know, and and pursuing it that way. Um, I'm part of a federal caucus over here that deals with salmon and steelhead uh, issues in the Columbia Basin. And that's how it's dealt with. So it doesn't change the track we're on to say exactly what we want out of it, but it might help with the tangle ups that we can get into with, with hiring um, and some of those, those kinds of things and might actually provide us more flexibility. So down the road, but just a thought I was having that I wanted to share. Great, thank you. Okay, so Martha, it sounds like you've got an action item. You've got your group identified. Um, Chris, anything else that you need directionally on those other topics related to the getting the agreements in place and uh, no, I think we can, maybe what we'll do too is part of the committee can kind of make a recommendation on what to do with the savings. Got it. So that's, that was the other big one was the savings. So you've got, yeah. you're going to put executable options in front of this committee um, for consideration in July on you know, the, the full costs and benefits of doing this in different ways. Um, and uh, so the, and, and the, and the expectation will be that you, you, you're, you're able to then execute that plan coming out of the July meeting. Yep. And in December, we talked about a potential detailer. Is that still on the table? Who's in the laps to cover the detailer? Yeah, we'll probably have to look at that again, too, and figure that out. I, but I, um, I'm thinking because it's taken so long, Michael, and we've, um, it's taken so long I worry a bit about having a detailer and putting it off for another year period of time, but but it, should, it certainly should be on the table. But I think we're closer to actually putting a position description out and hiring um, somebody rather than having it be a detail or a series of details. You know, I wasn't suggesting uh, delaying things. There's just a lag time between making the decision of what we want and actually getting a body in the chair. And do we want to fill that, that gap period, 120 days, whatever it might be, with a detailer, just to okay. keep momentum going? Yep. Great. OK, so that um, with that, and so Lori, we'll come back to your proposed changes um, for the IEO budget in 21 when we get to your IEO update. We will now shift to the 3 p.m. item on our agenda, uh, the IEO update um, from the summit. So I'll introduce uh, Danielle Euler from the Montana Bear Education Working Group. She chairs the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee's IEO group. Um, uh, and Danielle, can you see your slides? Yes. Oops. Yes. <laughs> and there we go. So just tell me when you are ready for, to advance as we go through this. Yeah, you can actually just start right there. So, um, so I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about the Grizzly Bear Information and Outreach Summit that was held at the end of January um, this winter and kind of tell you what it was about and what our conclusions were from the summit and just to give you kind of some background and then we'll talk about the recommendations. Go ahead. 
So myself and Sarah Silty, working for Montana Bear Education Working Group, um, helped Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks put together um, and execute this summit where we brought together folks from across, initially it was planned to be Montana, but we ended up having attendees from Idaho, Wyoming and Washington as well. Uh, come to talk about what everyone was doing for bear information education and outreach across that our region and beyond. Um, we had a couple of reasons for, for planning this summit. Uh, initially, we recognized a need to get a, a good picture of what was going on on the ground, who was doing grizzly bear information education and outreach, where and how, what services they provided and who they were. So one of our goals was to build relationships, to increase awareness, um, of those programs, then taking all those minds that were together in the same room, capture the recommendations they had for where there are holes and challenges and opportunities from those suggestions, developing action items, and then in all of these processes, help create or improve a consistency of bear safety and awareness messages across everyone who's practicing um, and teaching and sharing with the public. And then finally, one of the deliverables from this summit was to have a Montana Grizzly Bear Outreach Compendium uh, that detailed all of the attendees and folks who couldn't attend but wanted to have the work that they do um, recognized and, and being able to be searched by people who are curious about this topic or need resources. So to give you a, a profile of our, our attendees, we invited about 70 groups. Um, this could be tribes, agencies, nonprofits, and companies, as well as some individuals. So just under 100 people attended the summit, um, again, from a, a variety of different entities, representing about 40 groups. Uh, along with that was a, were five members of our Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council, which you'll hear more about during this meeting. So I'll give you a quick outline of what the summit looked like. The format was a half day in the evening, a full day, and then another half day morning. So the first evening we had the outreach trade show, we called it. So we had all of the attendees that were interested have a booth set up to explain what work they do, where they work, what kinds of materials and information they share so that we could all see what everybody else was doing. And we encouraged people to not stand at their booth, but instead to mingle and get to know each other. And so that was a great way to more informally get to know uh, other people. And actually, I mean, I have to say, I learned a lot about um, folks that I work with already and I didn't know all of the, the reach that they had or the areas they worked, there was a lot to be learned. The second day we had a panel discussion in the morning. And so we invited six panelists representing a variety of uh, Montanans from a uh, backcountry outfitter to one of the founding members of Bear Smart Big Sky to a rancher from the Ovando area. Um, we had a, a county commissioner and entrepreneur from uh, Southwest Montana, a member of a nonprofit organization with conservation and communities in the Whitefish area and one of our warden captains from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And we specifically picked the panel to, to represent folks that had a pretty good pulse on what was going on in current grizzly bear issues, but weren't necessarily practitioners of information. They weren't necessarily the people employed to do that work, but they had really good perspectives. So their discussion kicked off uh, all of the attendees talking about the challenges and issues related to grizzly bear IENO today. And so from that discussion, we had our attendees come up with their own themes. We can go back for a second, I do. Um, sorry. And so they came up with the themes they wanted to talk about, what they thought was most relevant to them. And then they self-selected into those groups. And in the, the first round of breakout sessions, we had our attendees identify um, the biggest challenges related to that topic. And then from there, we had them visualize the, the best case scenario without any uh, constraints. And then the next day, I can switch it, we had them imagine what they would need, what tools and resources and um, and, and ideas they would need to get from point A to point B, from the challenges to the solution. Um, and so from there, we took the very best of those ideas and asked them to, to produce those and then harvested that information, which is what I have as a summary here. Now, before I go any further, 
All of these recommendations and information about the summit is available. Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks website for the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council has a link to our report. Um, so that's just where we ended up being able to host the document online. So if you would like to read this in more depth, that's where it's available. So the first group was the, the messages group, just to, to show you what they came up with. I'm only going to talk about the recommendations, not all the points they talked about, because I want to just keep this um, succinct. So the group that talked about bear safety messages wrote out a recommendation of having a clearinghouse for bear safety messages, because they, they decided that there wasn't just one good place that everybody could go to find the information they need to know what's the most accurate and up-to-date and correct way to explain how to prevent bear encounters, what to do with bear encounters and attractants and all of that. The second recommendation was to make signage consistent and available, uh, it could be ads, brochures, and marketing. And this recommendation I don't believe was specific to one group or organization, it was just recognizing a need to have those messages um, correct in, in the outreach materials that, that groups were promoting. The next is audiences. So we had a group talking about the audiences that we're trying to, to get this information out to. Um, they, they recognize a variety of different audiences and talked about having messages that were appropriate for each audience. They talked about reconnecting to familiar audiences in new ways, as well as identifying and connecting with new audiences and how important it was to communicate with communities in newly occupied grizzly bear areas. We had another group on efficacy data and science and this group, instead of making recommendations, they identified three questions that they had, questions they would like answered to better understand what's going on for IENO. The questions were, what are the most and best effective tools for getting information out to the public? specifically to audience and messages? What is the current state of effect and effectiveness of grizzly bear information and outreach? And which human behaviors and strategies have the highest success in reducing conflict? The next group was partnerships. In fact, we had a lot of interest in this partnerships category. We had two subgroups that, that all talked on this topic. So the recommendation that was, I guess, that we highlighted from, from these groups was that um, the folks from, from some of these groups thought that it was important to let the agencies know, communicate about the role of agriculture and bear conservation to our agencies. So that was the highlighted point that they had. And then the rest of these points had to do with engaging and taking opportunities for relationships with different infrastructure um, companies, um, community members and HOAs and tribes and tourism departments and just different ways to, to connect with uh, those audiences and, and build partnerships. And we had another group on tools and delivery of bear safety messages. So they had several recommendations. One was to have ready-made materials, language resources, and that meaning like they know how to say what they need to say about bear safety as well as um, brochures and materials. So these are, these are materials that they could just reach for. Um, they didn't say who should do this, but they just said they would like to have a place they could go to get the materials they needed and customize them for their use, but know that the, the messages are accurate. They also recommended developing, oh, go back there, yeah. They de recommended developing a train the trainer program for various audiences. So it could be tailored to the audience you were speaking with, could be um, like at sporting goods stores, um, youth camps, conservation corps, just any groups that may need specific bear safety information because of the kinds of work they do. And then the last recommendation was to designate and make accessible proven conflict reduction tools. So with the caveat that they had to be known to be effective. And then the food storage and regulations group was another, another subtopic. Um, they made the point that for them, the more consistent bear safety, or I'm sorry, the more consistent that regulations are, food storage orders are across the areas they serve, the easier it is for them to, um, to uh, enforce those, those regulations. And then that there will always be challenges, but that consistency would be helpful. And then they also talked about uh, how important it is to help 
commu engage communities in helping create accountability for food storage. All right, so just to quickly go over some conclusions that we found from our, our summit, we did evaluations after the summit and found that 93% of participants would like to do another event like this. So the group of folks that, that have been talking about this summit after the fact, um, we thought maybe every three or four years, this would be something that we would um, host and that I, I don't know who or what agency would host it, if it'd be FWP again, if this is something that IGBC would be interested in, but that the, groups, the group wanted to come back together again. We could revisit the things that we thought were important to see where we've gone um, and where we need to go in the future. What was most valuable for people they identified was the networking opportunities, the panel discussion, and the breakout sessions. They did think that we could have used more time. I think um, we could have expanded it to at least three full days. I think they would have filled that time, no problem. More direction during the breakout sessions and then more pre-summit information available. Um, it's hard to distill all the takeaways into, into just a few things, but some of the things that came up time and time again on these um, evaluation forms were that people recognize there are a lot of passionate and diverse voices that care about grizzly bears, that they valued hearing the landowner and rancher perspectives and that they valued the connections they made at the summit. Um, many people also voiced that they were interested in exploring the idea that IGBC would help serve as a place for bear safety messages, resources, and materials. And then I just wanted to also give an update on the compendium. So our lead person on this was Sarah and she um, unfortunately left her position. And so um, we, we've kind of stalled out at the very end here, but we're, we're very close to getting done with this compendium form, which will be able to be a resource to show everybody what was, um, what was present at the time that we collected this information. So that brings up a couple more questions. One of the questions is, is this document a living document or a static document? Does it give you a snapshot from January of 2020 or do we wanna to continue to update this over time and have this be a resource that, that the public can access and understand who's doing what, what work where? This is just a, an important question. And the other question is where would it be hosted? So who would, who would take care of this document? Who would make it available? So those are the things, Lori will talk more about those, but that's a start. And I can take any questions. Okay, Daniel, I think what we'll do is we'll have Lori do the IEO presentation and then circle back because it, it, you know, there's a lot of connections here uh, with the work that you did. And so, and folks who got the briefing memo from Martha, there's a link in that document on this agenda item to the full report from the summit, uh, which Danielle mentioned. So, uh, Lori, let me pull your slides up. And do you wanna go back to the uh, uh, WMI piece now or, or just go into the summit? We can just continue, it's fine to go into the summit report, I think. So thanks. Um, first of all, I just wanna say that I think the IEO subcommittee and here's the members of the subcommittee, we have really, um, done some work and I'm really proud of this group. Um, we've all tried to really find some good ideas and bring them to the table and make some good changes. So um, you can go to the next slide. So one thing Danielle mentioned was this bear safety document, um, messaging document, and everyone got it in their um, packet. And so we, this came from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the Southwest Bear Education Working Group started with this document. And from that summit, it was very obvious that we needed to, um, or that people wanted consistent messaging across the board. Hold on, sorry. My window was open, it was loud. Um, we needed consistent messaging across the board. So we asked Danielle, um, cause she was kind of the lead on that document to, make it so it wasn't necessarily a Montana based document and make it more universal. And so um, it, it has some very universal messages and then it goes more into some audience specific and then what to do, um, you know, for bare food storage, kind of some, some overall arching um, ideas. And we hope that this document, um, the, what we're hoping is that maybe the, I, this group, the executive committee with IGBC will 
um, adopt this document and we can put it, house it on the website under the education information and outreach page and it will help people. Um, one, it can help with the conflict and mortality reduction work that the subcommittees are working on, but also it could help people that are trying to produce brochures or other IEO products to make sure that we have consistent messaging with different groups. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Dave. So that's kind of topic number one. And then along those lines, um, an ask, a question we're asking the executive committee is, I have been really shocked stepping into this chair position. This is my first meeting being the chair of the request to use the IGBC logo. Um, we, people are putting together mailers, um, they're putting together brochures, and they're more and more they're using the IGBC website as a place for people to go for information. But then they're also asking, um, they're asking two questions. They're asking one, to use the logo, and two, if we could put their brochure on our website so that's where people could um, get it. And as a subcommittee, we, we're not sure if we're, or we just want some um, ideas or some criteria that maybe the executive committee could give us to say, this is, you know, it has to have these different points and then yes, we would be okay with that. Or do we just wanna keep it simple? They can use our website to direct people that way, but we don't necessarily house their brochure on the website or, or, and we don't necessarily hand out the permission to use the logo. So um, that's kind of a, another question that the subcommittee is asking of the um, executive committee. You can go to the next slide. And then as Danielle mentioned, we have this FWP Summit Compendium. Um, it is a directory of NGOs and agencies that are doing bear work in and outside of Montana. As Danielle said, we're not sure if it's a snapshot in time or a living document. Um, I, our, subcom our subcommittee kind of recommended that if the summit, the IEO summit is something that's gonna continue that it would be something that could be a living document because you're always gonna have new, um, you know, new NGOs popping up or coming into the, to play um, in bear work and, or there might be a shift in how they um, do bear work. And so how it's designed is it has the table of contents kind of gives a geographic area of where each of those NGOs or agencies do work. And then it also gives a service. So do they um, help out with electric fencing? Do they help out with actual funding? You know, are they, do they respond to residents to help with different things? Um, so, it, but it does need work, I will say that. Um, it's right now just individual sheets. So there's a lot of, um, but we could put it into more like a phone book directory. Um, and does that wanna be housed on the IGB website um, for people to um, access it there? Next slide. And so those are kind of things that we were hoping to get decisions on and have some discussion if possible on. Um, I don't know how much time we have. We can also discuss more in the July meeting. Um, and then there's a couple of informative things that, that came up. The first one is this idea about Bear Smart communities. So I know um, there's a lot of different, so there's, you know, Bearwise Wyoming and there's Big Sky, um, the Bear community and Big Sky and every kind of state has their own. Um, Kim Johnson with People and Carnivores came to me and asked, she started, um, she kind of did a test community. I think it was Ennis, Montana. Um, so she did a test community this last, or she's been working on it for the last couple of years. And um, she's been working with the community on going around the community to find out where they can you know, use improvement for bear resistant containers. So parks, restaurants, um, you know, how much money it would be, here's the criteria that you need to meet. And she's been working with the local bear specialist, Kevin Fry. And so they've kind of, and they're using the um, basis of the Bear Smart community from BC um, to develop this program. And so she, she's really worked a lot, uh, really hard on developing this program um, to help facilitate communities. And so she was wondering if IGBC would like to, um, uh, approve or the criteria for these bear smart communities and have them up on our website um, and then give it kind of the IGBC stamp of approval 
like bear resistant containers get, but not necessarily um, something that people pay into. Um, and so she, she wrote a letter and I sent out the letter on Monday. So hopefully everyone had a chance to look it over. Um, and we, this was just kind of an informative introducing this idea to the executive committee. Um, and if people are interested in learning more, um, she can come up with more of the program and what it would entail. Um, but it was just, do you guys want to move forward with that idea? And then the last slide, David. And then the last idea that we had as an IEO subcommittee is I attended, um, and David, I think David did too, and so did Daniel Euler. We, the Park Service had a webinar series about, um, it was actually a bear smart community in Tennessee and the Smoky Mountains. But while I was listening to it, it gave me a great idea that in this time of COVID where we're not able to do a lot of bear fairs or do big group things, we could start our own IGBC web series. And so, you know, start small once a month, once every other month. We have a ton of potential speakers because we have all these bear specialists and land managers and research biologists. But could we come up with a one, once a month web series that people would have to register for um, and we would, you know, reach out to a wider audience and give bear safety messages and just or information um, to the public. And so, it hasn't gone much further than that. Our subcommittee is interested in pursuing it, but we were wondering if that's something that IGBC and the executive committee would want us to pursue. Um, we're not sure about the cost, the website capabilities, or the um, moderator time that would be needed because you can take public comments and questions kind of like Dylan's doing for us. So that's all something we could look into. And if um, IGBC is interested, is the executive committee is interested in this idea, we would come to you with more information on that. So I think that's, I kind of tried to keep it short and simple, but that's what we've been working on. <laughs> it is a lot, Lori. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. <laughs> oh, it just, it makes me laugh at your analogy <laughs> earlier, David, that, the, that you're piling the homework and the papers up on our desk <laughs> to review and look at. But yeah, um, I mean, I they're, it seems like five really substantive um, questions or areas that you're developing, you've just put before us. Yeah. So, David, do you want me to do the criteria now? Because that is one more thing that we're asking the subcommittee about before, or do you want to talk about um, some of those items? Um, maybe, maybe we do, you should do that um, to get, get it all on the table. But I guess the question then that this group needs to have is, how do you want to engage? You know, the, the IEO committee is asking for direction from the executive committee, mm -hmm. and you need some way. You know, there needs to be some sense of this larger group, and maybe there needs to be a smaller group that has some dialogue, or maybe there's a liaison to your committee. I don't, I don't know right. what the way to do it is, but um, yeah. these are, you know, it, it, we're not going to have time today. No, we yeah, have time. Um, you know, at the end of the month, and then obviously you've got your winter meeting, but. A lot of this is work that I mean that that summit came out of you know this is this is all recent and and um, important work. So let me pull up your uh... yep. So yeah. So then um, one thing. So the business items that we had. So we wanted. Oh, can you go back? Sorry. Right. Oh, yep. Right there. The business item. Okay. So um, one thing that I've just you know, I just stepped in this chair position, but one thing like that I have never noticed is we've never actually presented like, here's the work that we're going to give to WMI. And so um, we, this is gonna be their next round of work. One is um, they're, we're still gonna support the bear resistant container program. And Scott, I think is gonna talk about that later. Um, and then they're gonna support the implementation of IEO strategies. Um, we are, we do have money. We are contracting out some work for the website to, for it to get upgraded, um, which is going to be huge because that will make it a lot more easier to navigate. Um, and then we, they will also administer some of the IEO project funds that we award in December. Next item. So one thing that we I started doing and the group helped me was we looked at some of the old criteria for that funding for those grant funding. And so it was really, um, I felt like it was kind of limiting in the projects that could be 
um, put forth. So the projects, the very first criteria said that it needed to be information and education specific. Um, if you hit next one, David. So we um, wanted to come up with some new criteria to open up the projects to more infrastructure or um, actual preventative projects. And so we came up with this new list of criteria. Um, we wanted it, we, you know, we said it could be nonprofit and all the agencies. It must be consistent with the mission statement of IGBC and the roles and responsibility of the IEO subcommittee. And that helps because if you look at those, and I put that on your um, briefing packet, it does say that you know we will help with preventative work, and so that that kind of helps bring in more different pro, different kinds of projects. And then at least you have to be at least based out of one ecosystem. Next slide, David. And so we took the old criteria and we used some of those um, old criteria for additional consideration in people's projects. Um, next slide. And so our main goal for doing this was to add those opportunities for preventative or infrastructure like on the ground. So food storage boxes, um, electric fences, contracting groups to help install some of these things because it takes a lot not only to purchase the you know, boxes and electric fences, but then also installing some of this. And so we thought that this might help um, changing some of that criteria might help um, get more of those goals or those projects out there. Next slide. And so one way that we're recommending to do this is um, with COVID and um, kind of looking at how, what, where we spend that base funding from MWI, we are looking to not print so many brochures. And one thing that I did, and I'm showing you all here, and if you have your smartphones, that you can actually turn on the photo, if you turn on your camera app and just shine it up on that um, IGBC uh, QR code, it'll take you to the IGBC website. And so these QR codes, we are hope, hoping to print off, make them a very sturdy card and print them off and put them in all the bear boxes, education boxes that are out there, give them to all the bear specialists. And so instead of people giving a brochure, they can just go directly to the IGBC website. And so that might help um, with us not having to print so many brochures. And so um, MWI has funded projects before, but I feel like this might just give people an opportunity to say, oh, I could try to um, apply for this grant and get the funding through them. So, and this, we're asking to switch over. I think if you go to the, or no, I didn't put any. Um, yeah, if what we're proposing for now um, is to take $9,000 out of our, out of, or take $9,000 from that base budget and just put it over, um, it could be more, Chris and I were kind of talking about it, but putting it into the grant funding, it would still be a part of the $50,000 that MWI's base funding, but we would like to see it go more towards preventative projects from the grant money. So we're asking if you guys approve of the criteria and approve of us kind of using some of that base funding for these preventative projects. So that is now everything. <laughs> And so that that's a direct that, that piece was a direct uh, product of the discussion last summer. Um, you know, Matt Hogan had asked, you know, what, "What are we spending the dollars on?" And let's look at these at, at this. So this is a shift. This is a strategic shift that you're you're proposing. So I guess yeah. I'll ask the committee. You know, again, this is a lot of moving pieces from IEO. Um, you know, a lot of energy around it, um, and you, you you've got some of the material in the packet. You know, and, and it also is useful to look at it in the context also of what came out of that summit that Danielle described, and then also what we're going to hear about in a moment here that came from the subcommittees on conflict reduction. But right. anything else that we want to engage with Lori on or anything that you need from Lori before we get back together again in July? I have a million questions. <laughs> know that we can't get into now but what i'm hearing from you um this is the great thing about i think igbc is it's a mix of people who have been working on this for a long time and then some of us who are newer at least to the igbc but what i'm david and maybe you just said it and i'm only saying it in a different way or trying to amplify it 
is I'm, I'm hearing Lori uh, a switch from information and education only to really more preventive work. But then also it sounds like there is a growing request of the IGBC of um, having more centralized, focused, um, um, uh, consistent messaging, um, whether that's bear safety messaging, whether it's a request to use our logo, whether it's a request potentially for IGBC to house a compendium. So, so I think to recognize the moment in time where instead of all these different agencies and, and states wanting to be autonomous, which we are, but we're now needing, recognizing we need um, to try to be more consistent across all of us. So just, yep. I'm wondering what's driving that. I don't know that we have time to get into that, but just to yeah. notice that shift, right? And, well, and I whether think, I have that correct. Yeah. No, I think you're very correct. I think that people are really trying to grasp onto someone that can centralize a lot of stuff and they are looking to this group because of who is involved, who makes up this group. And it's easier to ask someone else to do the work. <laughs> well, and, and help fund it. Yeah. I'm in Toby. I see you guys lit up. Are you, what are you, are you seeing the same trend? Yeah, this is Tim, and I know I talked with our Bearwise person, and definitely, you know, infrastructure and prevention are definitely key things that we're trying to focus on and is important. And we redid, you know, we redid some of the, um, you know, we not only did redid the, the criteria, but we also redid the score sheet that um, they're, the committees are all how they're scoring this. Um, some of them use it as a guideline, some of them use it as an actual definite, this is who gets the project, but um, so. Yeah, if people just wanna make comments on that stuff and get it back to me, or I don't know, if we wanna wait and vote in July, cause that would be fine for the projects and the criteria change. Um, is there an item, Lori, are any of these items time, and Danielle, time, sensitive that you need a vote today or can they all be something that we get specific proposals to respond to in July? Yeah, um, no, we can, I mean, we can get more specific proposals to respond to in July. I think the two would definitely be the messaging because that's going to be um, the, the messaging, you know, in the compendium, I, you know, I don't know if it needs to be a July thing or if it can wait till the winter, especially because it's not um, organized very uh, just uh, well right now. Um, and people haven't really been asked. I don't know if Danielle's gotten people asking about it, but right now I haven't really necessarily had people asking about it. Um, but I do think the bare messaging and then the criteria, if you guys are okay with approving that criteria change and using some of the base MWI dollars um, for projects instead of um, supplies or, or wherever the, the money was. And Lori, I'll just move on to just make a comment and add to what you were saying about the, the changing for the criteria. I just wanna emphasize that we're not saying the funding shift is going to go from INE to preventative. It's just expanding the circle of what we consider. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then the other thing I wanted to say is even though we're not printing brochures this year beyond what we already had in the stockpile, the coloring book and bear spray brochures are in printable format on the IGBC website for anyone to download for free at this mm -hmm. point. And we'd like to continue to expand that opportunity in the future for a way for the public to get it because we it, yep. yeah it's the distribution network is challenging sometimes it is challenging and we are you know we still do have some money that could be for short runs um or people can apply for the for a grant to say i would love you know a bunch of printed of these printed coloring books and this is how much money in printed coloring books so um so to clarify the request before mm -hmm. us um, the, at least the Bear Smart community, the criteria, it's not to vote on that today. It's to direct you to bring, whether we want you to bring that to us in July in a format 
that we can discuss and potentially vote on it? Is it something that we're interested in taking up? Yep. The, the, yeah. So the two things, yeah, that's a good point. The two requests are for the information ones. Do you want to hear more about the Bear Smart communities? Would IGBC, you know, want to have that as something that they are, you know, they have their stamp of approval on? Um, and then, you know, would you guys want to get more information on us housing a webinar? And then, yeah, that's more, those are more informative. Um, the things that we kind of want decisions and moving forward on are the Met the bear safe the bear messaging document can that be an IGBC document on the web the criteria and then what to do with these requests or you know should we come up with some kind of criteria or can the executive committee come up with the criteria for us using the logo and housing people's brochures on our website it's sort of a higher level strategic question yeah. so in the same way that IGBC is authoritative in certifying you know, bear resistant containers, do you wanna take on the role of also being authoritative when it comes to these bear messages, which right now of course exist in many places and everyone has different things, which is, you know, that was what Summit was able to highlight and, and collect in that compendium. So um, lots on the table here and, uh, <laughs> uh, and it's related, you know, the point that, that Danielle just made about um, INE as a, it's still INE, even if it has a preventative benefit, um, uh, is going to come up, come back again here in the next presentation. So I guess anything else for Lori and Danielle right now, and we'll save some time and bring you back here um, once Hillary has put the subcommittee work on the table. So we'll shift then to um, Hillary Cooley, who is the uh, one of the IGBC advisors and the grizzly bear coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and she works with all of the subcommittees who have um, done work that was reported on in December on uh, conflict and, and uh, conflict and mortality prevention. So, Hillary, take it away. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah, I guess I just have to say I'm pretty impressed with the subcommittee, the IEO subcommittee. It's great to seems like I, um, IGBC is modernizing a bit and that was much needed, so nice job. Okay, David, we can go to the next slide. I guess I just brought all of the info together from the um, subcommittee reports and just wanted to remind people what this task was. And actually, there were three kind of subtasks in this that the IGBC asked each subcommittee to do. We're at the final stage now, although we don't have it today. This is what we hope to get towards next month. Um, so it'd be maybe a, a, a little bit of delay from the final due date, but this is, this is what we're getting at here. And I'm gonna give you the, um, where each subcommittee is right now. Okay, so each subcommittee took a little bit of a different take on this task. So I'll just give you a little background on how they did it. The MCDE gathered a technical group of interagency people, uh, bear specialists, I was part of it, Lori was part of it, um, from state, tribe, federal agencies. We looked at mortality data over two periods and, and trends within there, 99 through 2008, and then wanted to compare it to the more recent decade, just to see if things, if there were major changes that have occurred. Um, once we looked at that data, uh, we narrowed down the priority topics into four causes. Um, doesn't mean this is not necessarily the top sources of mortality, but these are the ones that we thought we could be most effective in addressing as a subcommittee. Shooting related, uh, railroad collisions, vehicle collisions, and site related conflict. Next slide, David. So I, I, you know, this is just a real quick summary and I put, um, I, I, that's exactly what it is. So the bullets, I won't go spend a whole lot of time going through each one of them, but once we identified those top priority issues, we got together several times to discuss some recommendations on um, how to address and what needed to be addressed. So shooting related, there were a number of things in there um, some of them had to do with 
mistaken identity. So we recommended targeting I and E at black bear hunters. Some of it was we had bird hunters, recreationists, not realizing they were in bear habitat. So targeting specific I and E at those groups, as well as with rifle hunters. I think most of you are aware last year we had a lot of railroad collisions in the NCDE. Um, and it's, we usually have a handful every year, or maybe not a handful, but we, it's, it's, it's fairly common. And um, those things can be addressed. And so that was one of our recommendations to review the strategies to mitigate them, make sure livestock exclusion fencing is going on, involving the railroads in the subcommittee. They are not a part of it right now. Um, vehicle collisions have also gone up. And so we think we could do some work there and increase engagement with the Department of Transportation, improving signage, coordinating with NGOs maybe who have a strong interest in, in reducing this, and then site conflict. Um, so dealing with waste management issues, information education related to small livestock like chicken or hobby farms, and thinking about how can we enforce. Next slide. So the other thing, NCDE, they came up with these overarching recommendations. And one of those, you know, they made the, they noted that these things are not going to be addressed immediately. And so maybe it's a good idea to start thinking about long-term working groups around each of these priorities. Um, some of these really could benefit from external groups, maybe somebody from the waste management um, industry, somebody from the hunting industry. And so that was a question for the subcommittee. Can we do that? Um, NGOs could be helpful as well. So thinking about how could, can we and how can we do that? And then everybody noted that we've got strategies or some of the issues are common among all of the ecosystems. So let's try and coordinate uh, where those trends overlap. Okay, I think we're gonna move to GYE next. So GYE was a little different. They had done a lot of work in the past on this in 2009 the study team put out a, a basically this conflict report. That did, they did the same thing and it was pretty um, lengthy. So what they did for this task, they didn't redo the entire conflict report, but they went back and looked to see of the recommendations, what have they done and what, have, what accomplishments are there. Um, from there, the yes, the subcommittee identified priority topics. And then um, I think you heard a little bit about this maybe from Trish, the subcommittee put on a public workshop um, and David facilitated that, that was in the fall last year to, and also involved the technical teams to come up with recommendations targeted at each of the other five topics. And you can see the topics down there. Um, the other thing that this subcommittee um, noted as NCDD, NCDE did is that some of the topics um, are consistent across the ecosystems and they identified that these, those numbers four and five could be best, possibly best um, uh, worked on by the, by the full committee, IGBC. And some of them are maybe more specific to yes. So those first three backcountry rec, they've already been working on that. Uh, front country conflicts, community planning and livestock conflicts and related produ producer outreach. So here are some of the recommendations. And like I said, you know, th there was a, a great participation at that public working group and the li list of strategies and recommendations to address these things was huge. So the, the technical team whittled it down a little bit and, and I'm trying to summarize here. Um, you can see they have a lot of ideas and ways to address these things, whether it's targeted training, game storage, standardizing signs, um, Again, it's a, there's a messaging issue that um, needs to be addressed in different ways, whether it's roadside bear management strategies um, or consistent messaging on federal lands, engaging producers. Um, and then the two for IGBC that they tagged, um, they said, you know, we've got so much effort and attention on information education, all sorts of different um, brochures. And we've never really evaluated to see what is most effective. 
So they suggested engaging social science um, experts to figure that out. And then if we can figure out what's more effective, you know, put all of our, or try and put our eggs in that basket or those baskets. Um, and proactively looking for more funding for that. There's always a huge need. Um, the other one for IGBC is the expansion area, um, <laughs> education and expansion area. Bears are moving out. We have dispersers between ecosystems and that's a, that's a key area for making sure subcommittees are working together, probably through the IGBC. Finally, uh, Selkirk and Cabinet Yak subcommittee. Um, this one's a little bit different. They have two small populations and the mortality information is, or mortality rates are much lower. Um, but they did examine the human cause mortality for, for the last 18 years and they identified the top sources of mortality, human cause mortality, mistaken identity, defense of life, poaching, and they also have a train and auto collision problem there. Next one, David. Yeah, so they came up with this list. A lot of this stuff is ongoing in the ecosystems, the bear spray training, fencing seminars, garbage can loaners. There's a number of program, ed programs going on. Um, they suggested for most of these things, continuing that and improving, improving enforcement. Um, having a mandatory black bear identity, identification course, um, improving highway fencing and crossing structures and continuing carcass pickup. So that was the summary, you know, so we had, each subcommittee got together with the, got these drafts together. And then a few weeks ago, we had a, basically a working group discussion with members from each of those technical teams across the ecosystems. And then I think Chip Corsi was there, some other subcommittee members were there, Randy Arnold was there to talk about this uh, um, just initially, how we might think in the future, hopefully at the July meeting on how, what needs to be coordinated through IGBC and how to do that. So I hope we'll get to that next month. Thanks for that summary, Hillary. And, and I mean, so the idea here was the, the subcommittees reported their status in December. Um, and some of it is gonna be coming out in, in, in quite a bit of detail. The, the uh, Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee has about a 30 page paper. Uh, I think it may be actually longer than that. Uh, but they're, they're also doing a process right now where they're prioritizing it and trying to focus, you know, as Hillary mentioned on the things that they're, that they're gonna be actually trying to move the needle on. Um, so you've, you've, you've got that work in the subcommittees, you've got these observations about things that may cross subcommittee boundaries. And, you know, it's, it's similar to what we just heard from the, you know, what came out of the IEO summit, similar to some of the thinking that you're hearing from Lori Roberts in the IEO subcommittee. Um, so we have six minutes left to get us back on track, I guess thoughts about this work. And, and we have the subcommittee reps on the line. So I guess, you know, Tricia or um, Rodney or Randy, anything to, to add here uh, 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 where you're, from where you're sitting? Uh, David, this is Randy. I, would, I guess what I would add is that this is a very, I'm very glad that the conversation has um, come to the IGBC in this way. Um, where I feel the NCDE could continue to work on these locally within our um, subcommittee. There was just way too much that was similar to the other ecosystems and way too many of these issues that are out, that are um, concerning outside of the NCDE footprint and in some of the land in between the subcommittees. So I think it is elevating it to this IGBC discussion and, um, is really important. Uh, both in that role as the IGBC may be looking at this um, uh, between the subcommittees as well as the commonalities among them. So I'm just really glad it's going this direction, even though we'd be happy to take those necessary pieces that we have to move more immediately and or can keep working on, we're happy to take that work on, but just felt reluctant to keep working on those things that need to be more common. So just wanted to provide that support. And, and I would add, 
Um, to, to, I agree with Randy. And I would add that even though some of the things identified by one subcommittee doesn't mean it won't happen eventually in another location. So um, I think it'd be really valuable to continue to work together, even on those things that aren't common. Yeah, and, and this is Trisha. The only thing I would add, completely agree with what's been said um, by the subcommittees. And, um, you know, I think that none of us want to invest uh, resources or, or let, let me say this a different way. I would love it if we were, if we knew we were investing resources as a subcommittee in something that would benefit grizzly bears everywhere. Um, and I think the example of um, where we we're moving on sort of the, the education around backcountry hunting camps um, and their staff and the, with the Wyoming Outfitter and Guide Association, you know, like Tim mentioned, I think that is something, again, that, that should be, be able to use broader. And so us being cognizant of what others are working on, but then also how what's the avenue to collect collectively figure out here's a couple of things that IGBC could either take on or we take on as, as sort of joint subcommittee work. Uh, I just really think we'll do better for bears in the long run. I'm gonna jump in because it'll be, I, uh, you know, as we continue to talk about this, I don't, I wanna clarify I think, or ask a clarifying question is, we're not talking about um, completely moving away from the recovery areas, recognizing there and just, yeah, um, that there are different places. What we are talking You're having, about- You're having a little interference there, I'm not sure, I lost my microphone. Okay. Um, I, that we, what you've raised demonstrates a need to talk about issues that transcend um, recovery areas. That doesn't mean we don't still also um, talk about what the specific recovery, area, recovery areas need. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think I've seen a trend where this can really help. That doesn't mean we're leaving behind, for example, um, the bitter or other areas that have may have different issues. Yeah, so uh, you, there was a little bit of interference there, Martha. I, I'm going to try to re rephrase or restate what you said. Um, you're you're saying that re recognizing these cross uh, landscape issues doesn't mean moving away from continuing the work. You know, uh, recovery zone by recovery zone. So, and that, that is a key point. It's certainly I've heard it from the Yellowstone group that I work with in my day job. They're happy to do their work and they're, they're proud of their work and it's, um, they're, they're moving ahead. Um, but just as the one example, the efficacy of information education, you know, that was a question that, you know, those four supervisors didn't want to keep putting, committing money and resources, but it's a social science question that sort of is, transcends, you know, any one zone and it's hard to answer and even it even came out of the summit as, as a, something that we need to need some focused attention on uh, as we're trying to be good stewards of these resources and, and make sure our, our messages hit their audiences. So I'm seeing a lot of cameras off here, um, right when the conversation is getting really interesting. Um, what do folks what are, what do folks think here? So again, we've we've you've heard from the information that there was this summit across the whole range on on, on I and &E. You heard from the I and &E, um, subcommittee itself. And then now you've heard from these subcommittees answering the, the, uh, the call from, from IGBC to report on prevention, um, uh, on conflict prevention. Uh, and, and then I guess maybe Toby, we th should throw your, your thoughts about you know, the IGBC into this as well. Thoughts here for now. And then what do you wanna see with this as, with, as we, you know, we don't have any more things to report to you in July. Everything is being discussed here at this meeting. It's just that in July, you have some more time to, to think about it, digest it, and, um, and come back to it. So I guess with that frame, uh, I'm seeing lots of cameras come back on. So who's got some thoughts? So 
So David or, or Martha, maybe just a suggestion. I, I, I'll speak for myself. Three hours into these calls, they get a little fatiguing doing these video calls. And I'm wondering, um, rather than open it up to a broad, like, what are your thoughts? Is there like a, I see there's several discussion questions in the materials you sent out. Could we, maybe that would focus people's thinking a little bit if we focused on some discrete questions as opposed to an open-ended, what do you think? Because right now I'm not sure I think anything other than uh, what month is this? What day is this? What hour is this? You know, it's all running together in my head, so. Fair enough. And it's, we're actually at the point where we need to shift gears um, and hear a uh, very related um, and timely report um, from a, an effort underway in the state of Montana sort of coming at the same set of issues, but from a very different perspective than, than this interagency group has in the past. So I guess it's a good point, Matt. So what we're trying to get to here is um, you've got some explicit requests from Lori and for direction on how does IGBC move forward with I and E efforts. You've got subcommittees reporting, here's what we're doing on, on conflict reduction but also recognizing that some of it is beyond their, <laughs> beyond their scope. Um, so it's almost like we need to put all this together for you, synthesize it down a little bit and, and, and have a focused discussion. And, and it, I'm trying, I'm just looking for, that, that's what, that's what the, the bulk of the agenda in addition to these business items is gonna be focused on here um, in July. Thank you, David. I think that's really helpful to clarify that um, this is really good work that everyone's brought before us to digest that we're not looking for specific decisions today, but it's introducing the topics for us to think about and perhaps address the next agenda. I mean, the next meeting. Okay, so to, just to add additional complexity, uh, I'm gonna shift it over and I think Heather Stokes has joined us. Um, Heather is at the University of Montana and she's the facilitator for the Montana Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. And actually I'm gonna stop my sh screen sharing Heather because you're just gonna talk to us, but let me know when you're ready for that timeline slide. Hey everyone, thanks for, for having me. I, um, as David mentioned, I'm one of the co-facilitators for the Montana Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council along with my counterpart, Sean Johnson. And we're with the Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy at the University of Montana. And it's been really great. I've been logged on here for the last couple of hours and it's been really great to hear all of the different collaborations between the subcommittees, between the states, between the feds and the states. Um, and I'm hoping that in my update on what the council has been doing, you'll hear additional efforts within our state amongst a diverse group of Montana citizens also collaborating with each other really for the purpose of coming up with some recommendations in building collaboration and addressing grizzly bear um, conservation and management within the state of Montana. I did speak with you all at the December meeting and, and gave you a brief overview of what the council was doing. I know a number of you are new and it's been a long time, so I'll just reiterate what their purpose is. And it's, it's really to develop realistic and actionable recommendations for fundamental guidance and direction on key issues and challenges related to the conservation and management of grizzly bears in Montana, with the caveat that it's particularly those issues in which there's significant social disagreement. And back in March of last year, the governor put out a request for applications to Montana citizens um, to apply to be on this council. Applications were due in April. Governor's office appointed 18 council members last August. And in October, they had their first meeting. And David, if you put that slide up, I'll just, use this as a point of reference to, to demonstrate what the council has been up to over these last eight, nine, 10 months. 
And really the first several meetings were about developing shared understanding, knowledge, and developing relationship with each other. As I mentioned, they're a diverse group representing livestock industry, conservation, recreationists, um, everything under the sun that, that you could imagine in terms of what demographic might be in Montana. I think the governor's office really worked hard at selecting 18 people that had as diverse representation as possible. So a number of them represent a number of different groups, not just one group. They do represent themselves as citizens and not necessarily um, the agency that they work for or the community that they're in, although they are liaisons to their community in engaging the public and bringing back in public concerns from their community. So there's really this attempt at integrating diverse perspectives in understanding what the issues are around grizzly bears. And if you go to the website, uh, the FWP, dot mt dot gov slash gbac which governors grizzly bear advisory council um, you'll find the executive order with the charge and the issues that they are addressing and again back to the timeline they, they spent a lot of time really addressing content as a way of gaining some shared understanding and knowledge of the issues when we hit I would say December, January, it was really starting to engage in more discussion and really trying to hear and understand each other's perspectives and the experience and diversity that they brought to each other. So not only hearing from content experts, FWP put together a support team of a number of different agencies within the state, federal, tribe, that consists of our technical and content experts that have been available in providing presentations and answering questions related to content, but also having the council members really engaged in their own conversation in distilling and synthesizing and understand the information that's been presented to them. And they've been since January working in articulating those ideas in writing. So from October to December, it was really more discussion, getting to know each other, creating safety and trust amongst each other. In January, they really started within working groups and putting some of that in writing. And, and I know you guys are, are really, really busy. All of their documents, in order to be as transparent as possible, are posted on the GBAC website. Um, if you want to get into the weeds, there's that possibility, or you can go to the latest document that we've got posted on there from June 6th at the last meeting, where they can have consolidated a number of their ideas that are, that are starting to turn into recommendations. And really, as you'll see on this timeline, COVID happened, as you've all already been discussing in your initial updates. And what's been really remarkable with the council is at the time where many people have been so incredibly distracted and pulled in a number of directions, this is when the council has really just delved in, had a number of video meetings. All of the ones that they've had have been streamed live for the public and are recorded and available on the FWP website. And they've really dug in and wanted to get into conversations around some of the more difficult issues and requested some additional meetings in order to further understand and have discussions such as around social tolerance and livestock and agricultural loss and compensation. So they've really been taking their role very seriously, dedicating an inordinate amount of time, and now really trying to come to a point to where they can articulate and synthesize their ideas in a way that demonstrates the process that they've gone through in terms of not just about how do they share their recommendations, but how do they share the process in which they got to their recommendations so that there's an understanding of what's behind the content and what's behind the intention. And so what they're working on right now here in the next couple of weeks actually, is there's been a writing team um, where a number of council members volunteered to be on this writing team 
to synthesize this latest document online to really look at what their vision is, what their charge has been in terms of a preamble, what their guiding principles have been all along the way so that it sets the context and the framework for the recommendations. And if you've been following what the council has been doing and still, if you haven't, just knowing about all of the contentious issues around grizzly bears is that there are issues where there are still differing opinions. And so as much as we've been really helping them engage in conversation to hear and understand each other's perspectives and share each other's perspectives to see if there's a way to come to consensus around a number of recommendations. There is areas, there are areas where there is not consensus. And so it's really about how can they convey what those issues are, what's behind why there's not consensus and to provide some meaningful guidance to the state around what does that mean and what can the state do with these issues and what are the recommendations behind, and I'll, I'll use hunting for an example, not putting out position statements or advocating pro or against hunting, but really having an understanding of what's underlying that and what can the state use to help move forward in addressing the role of hunting, for example, or in conservation and management of grizzly bears. So again, it's not about them making a decision around it. This is a council that's really coming up with recommendations and trying to shed light on some of the layers underneath these issues that we know exist. And so that's what they're working on right now is how to further articulate that in a way that gets at some of these underlying layers and in a way that's helpful to the state. So I didn't go through month by month. I thought by having that on the screen, you could take a look at that. Wanted to offer opportunity to engage in some discussion or questions in terms of how this work might be relevant. Some lessons learned from us, we'll be able to share more of that uh, once the council does put out their recommendations, we are still on track to have a final report to the governor's office by the end of August, so by the end of the summer. So despite COVID, despite all of the other disruptions, we're still on track and um, truly commend these 18 council members and all of the support team in staying engaged, staying attuned and continuing the hard work. So I don't know, David, if, if there was more that you wanted me to address or Martha. If well, were... I, it's, it's perfect. And I'm just holding up here and it was, so there's a link in the briefing memo and it's also on the, the website to the, that June 6th draft. And it's obviously a draft and it's gonna probably change quite a bit. But what I, I guess I wanted this group to be aware of in particular is just the subject headers that this group of citizens has taken on with the benefit of consultation with some of these technical folks, you know, who are our agency staff, they have a whole set of recommendations on education and outreach. They have a set of recommendations on bear distribution, on connectivity, on relocation, on conflict prevention, on agriculture, on public land. So it's it's a it's a pretty amazing breadth of uh, work that they've taken on, and you know, some of the things are are similar to the things that you've heard reported out. Uh, from from your IGBC subcommittees here today. So um, Martha, I'm, did you want to? I don't. I don't. I don't need to add in. I think you guys have done a good job. And and um, I just got a call as an anecdote. Um, a member of the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council called me late uh, Friday night, just giddy with saying how um, she thought they had made such great progress even last Friday and think that they're getting their gelling and that they really might provide some helpful recommendations. Um, they're not just going through the motions, but that they really are providing something that might be actionable. And, and, and kudos to everybody engaged in it. It's been a, a fun process to watch. It's been fun. It's been commendable. They are taking their role extremely seriously and really putting their sincere effort into collaborating on this and really finding a way to have the conversation to, to see where they can come to agreement. And last Friday, just to kind of 
tie in both the document that David referenced and, and what Martha, you were referencing is that the writing team met for over six hours on Friday. Don't get attached to the June 6th framework. <laughs> the, the content will be in there, it will be represented. Um, but in the meeting on June 8th and 9th, they really talked about a different way of structuring the content that would be more user friendly to those reading it, both the public and, and to the state. Um, and a way to really convey more of, of their discussion. And I'm glad to hear you got that call, Martha. That's, that's um, aligned with what I'm experiencing with them as well. So they've been great. It's great to share the update with you. And I imagine they'll be really excited to share their report if you are so interested in your winter meeting. Definitely. <laughs> That's terrific, Heather. Thank you so much. Any questions for Heather? And again, it's very transparent to, to watch that group work. Their, their meetings are on Zoom and all their documents are on that uh, uh, website. So um, thanks to Heather. And so here we are, it's 4.30. Um, Scott Jackson, you're next on the agenda. Um, let me, do, do you wanna, um, if you could, if any, any minutes that you could give us back become a break for this group before 4.45. Glad to do it, David. So <laughs> Scott Jackson, I'm an advisor to IGBC, I'm a Forest Service Carnivore Program Lead, and I oversee the um, IGBC's Bear Resistant Products Testing Program. And um, yeah, I'm happy to cut what I can out of that coveted last presentation slot. Um, so I don't know, David, if you can, I had a slide or two, but, um, it's, it should all yeah. be right there. There you go. So, uh, a minute of, of background is, you know, attractive storage is a, is a, one of the keys that we need to, uh, address for successful grizzly bear recovery is an important uh, priority for all the, uh, IGBC subcommittees in the, in the ecosystems. And so, uh, 20, plus years ago to pr help provide good information to consumers and to agencies relative to what kinds of projects um, could be considered bear resistant. Uh, the IGBC put effort into developing a program to uh, test products, commercially available products, and um, make a, a determination whether they met standards that we had developed for being bear resistant. And um, at the winter meeting in Missoula last December, I provided a a short update on um, some uh, revenue shortfalls that program was experiencing. Uh, kind of went through more detail then about how the program was funded, what the sources of income were, were what some of the reasons we saw for the shortfall had been. Um, and then uh, we talked about what we were gonna do about it. And I said, I would get back to you at the summer meeting with what we had done. So that's what I wanna do here in the next two minutes here. So um, since that December meeting, we've taken a number of actions to um, address the program revenue shortfall. More information is in that briefing packet that the executives received, but, but in a nutshell, um, it's on the screen here. We raised each product's testing fee $100 per product. Um, so now, for instance, to get a cooler, for instance, tested with the live bears um, at Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center, it's like $725 now. Um, we revised the testing fee revenue split. Um, we, we partner with Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center in West Yellowstone. They have um, captive grizzly bears there. Um, they do the testing and as per our protocol, provide us with the testing results and we make a determination whether we approve those or not. We split the, the testing fee revenue with them. It used to be a 50-50 split. We renegotiated that and now IGBC, um, receive 75% of that, um, those testing fees and 25% and go to the Discovery Center. And then um, that we did send out a mailing. We had discussed and, and shared with the larger committee through a series of emails and opportunities to review and comment um, that we wanted to implement an, an administrative fee. Um, previously, the income coming into the program was through testing fees you're seeing fewer products tested. And so, um, and a bigger part of the workload for the program was administering the database and the information flow and all the changing businesses and, and um, you know, field failure reports and things like that that we were having to deal with. So we wanted 
the administrative part, the care and feeding part of the program to provide some revenue as well. So we implemented a fee uh, that would be like $100 per product um, to maintain their product on our list. That helps us communicate better with those manufacturers. It helps keep us current in which products are still being manufactured, which ones have changed over time and maybe don't meet our specs anymore. Um, making a, a, a more streamlined and um, valuable information source for the public when they access our product list online. So uh, in mid-April to the end of April, I guess we sent out uh, letters uh, talking about this new administrative fee. We sent them out to 112 manufacturers. As of last week, we'd received about a third of those back, 37 responses, um, and we generated $4,600 in administrative fees thus far. Um, so, you know, that's money that hadn't been coming into our program previously. Um, you know, that said, the, the bulk of the funding for the program still comes in through testing revenue. Um, we don't, we're having a low, another slow year in products being submitted for testing, whether that's COVID related, um, that probably has a lot to do with it just because a lot of uh, businesses are slowing down. Um, so it's too early to know in this testing season whether we will have a shortfall or not, but we're hopeful that with these um, actions that we've taken that we will address the shortfall and we will be able to stay fully funded um, through the rest of the testing season. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, this was, you know, Chris Smith with WMI, you know, these monies are, are um, administered through the WMI um, IEO agreement. And Chris was really implementing, uh, instrumental in implementing this uh, admin fee, along with our program assistant, Patty Soka. Um, I think Chris is on the line. I don't know, Chris, if you had anything to add to this. Um, but other than that, that's all I had to say. Happy to answer any questions or, or Chris, if you had anything to add. So Scott, this was informational for the group today. Is that right? Yep, just reporting out on what we had talked about in December. Okay. Great. Any, any questions for Scott? Okay, well then where we are, we, we still have a, 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 a substantive agenda, two substantive agenda items left. We're gonna do the public comment at 4.45. Um, so we'll, be, we'll take a break until then. Um, I wonder if I can, oh, I guess I can't. Can't edit this. Oh well. Um, at 4:45 sharp, we'll uh, uh, come back. And so, Dylan uh, Tabish, if you're on the line, um, what do you have in the queue? Have you received some written comments? And then, folks, if you look on your agenda, um, there's a there's a phone number to call to get into the waiting room. So, Dylan, what's the what's the update here on the public comment? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, we have one written comment that they'd like me to read to the group, and then we do have. Uh, three attendees in the uh, kind of the waiting room, so to speak, Rob Cheney, Dan Tires, and then a phone number ending in 109. So uh, all of you, those three folks in there, um, if you would like to comment, press star nine, or I guess raise your hand, I'll go through and allow you to talk when we get to the public comment portion. But otherwise, for everyone else, if you would like to comment here in a few minutes, uh, on the IGBC online meeting website page, there's that phone number to give a call to. So call that number, uh, enter the webinar ID and the password, and that will put you into this kind of queue and will give you an opportunity to comment. So now would be a good time to log into that uh, if you would like to provide comment. And that information is on the igbconline.org slash meetings site where this uh, is being streamed as well. Great. And we'll, what we'll do is we will take five minutes right now. 445 Sharp will be back to open up that queue and hear from folks who've been with us all day. And then uh, the last bit of agenda item is to talk about July. So thanks so much.
Okay, folks, it's uh, 4.45. Um, Dylan, why not, if you could start for us with the written comment, and then again, folks who wanted to make a, 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 a statement or, or, or put some input into this group's discussion, the phone number to do so is on the screen right now. Um, so Dylan, take it away. All right, uh, thanks, David. So the written comment I received is from Mike Bader in Missoula. Uh, he, his comment is, the recent paper by Michael Proctor and others demonstrates the relationship between forest roads and survival of independent female grizzly bears. Poaching has been a significant source of mortality and due to its secretive nature and the fact 90, 95% of the grizzlies in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem are unmarked, detection is difficult. Why then are forest roads not included in your list of significant sources of mortality? And so that comment was emailed to me uh, from Mike Bader in Missoula. Um, so now I will open up our attendees list. I already got confirmation from Rob Cheney, who's in there that he does not have a comment. Um, Dan Tires, I see you in there. So I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, Dan, you're unmuted. Did you have a comment uh, that you wanted to provide? And you are un, well, let me unmute you. Dan, it's not letting me unmute you for some reason. So I don't know if you're, oh, there you go. Dan, uh, do you have a comment? No, I don't. Thanks for the consideration though. Okay, yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, and then next we have a phone number, area code 406. And then the last three numbers are 109. So you are unmuted, uh, phone number 406 ending with 109. So if you have a comment, please state your name and where you're from. No, I have no comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'll pause here uh, for a second to see if anybody else is going to call in. Uh, like David mentioned, if you call that uh, number on the screen uh, or on the website, you'll be admitted into this uh, little call in queue. Not seeing much. So I guess, uh, David, if you'd like to can proceed and if somebody does pop in there, maybe I could chime in and let you know that someone came in late if you'd like, or um, we can pause for a little bit longer. Sure. Uh, Martha, any thoughts uh, on how to proceed here? We were. Um. I think we can go forward, but certainly interrupt Dylan if somebody um, calls or sends in a comment. And I wonder just, you know, to, to ask, um, to think down the road, if it would be more helpful for me to stop and um, turn to you throughout the agenda and see if anybody has called in. It seemed like that didn't happen today, but I know we as a, as a council have been interested in how do we um, provide opportunity for comment, so. Yeah, and one thing we talked about, Martha, with this agenda was putting the, this discussion about how you're gonna use your time in July after mm -hmm. the public comment, you know, and so that we could take, take, you know, take stock of what we had heard. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any, any reaction there, or um, you, know, you certainly got a lot of content presented this afternoon um, that we now have uh, some agenda time in July to program around some next steps. So um, maybe Martha, it makes sense to just, just you know reflect here uh, about how this virtual setting worked um, and, and what you might need, because this was obviously more one-way presentation. Um, in July, you've got a lot of questions on the table and there's gonna be a need for some more discussion. Uh, yeah, and I would throw it out to others, but I was thinking through that, that we um, had tried to shift away from just having presentations. You know, while we have all of these pretty fabulous people gathered, um, it needs to be worth everyone's while. At the same time, I was reflecting on it and thought, well, it makes sense to some degree that today was mostly um, information items because were we to be meeting in person, it would be a combination of information and then the ability to engage and deliberate more. So um, it makes sense to me that we needed, there's so much good work, we needed the information today and that the next meeting we're having um, virtually, we will need to be experimenting on how to engage more. 
So that that's my thinking, but I would, um, I'm totally, I'd like to hear from others on how today worked for you. Okay. Yeah, this is Tim from, from Wyoming. I liked a lot of the presentations, like Lori's presentation now, I think we can almost make some of those decisions via email because we got to see the presentation, we got to ask questions, now we can go back, think about it a little bit. And something like that, I don't know if we need to deliberate anymore on. Uh, maybe others do, but I think that sets us up so we can go back and make a, some more informed decisions. But that, that's my take on some of these things. We could take some things and maybe handle them over email. Great. Hey, Martha. Start. Yes. One question I had was, is in July, are we going to have an executive committee meeting only? Or is this going to be streamed on YouTube, um, the whole thing? Um, you know, we hadn't talked about it. Um, we when what we've gone into executive um, session often when we're talking about litigation, right? Current litigation, and um, then certainly last summer, our session, our planning session, which I think was. I think we all found really helpful. So are you suggesting you'd like uh, at least some time that's executive session? Well, I, I yeah, I guess I would like, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, a couple meetings ago, uh, having a sort of a splitting up the meeting and allowing, uh, you know, um, sort of a, a sort of a, a working opportunity for the committee and then another opportunity for the public and the reports. And, uh, you know, I was hoping that we could uh, maintain that sort of idea um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Duly noted. Are there other thoughts on that? What are the needs? What are you, did we meet your needs today? And how do we make sure we meet everyone's needs um, as we set up the agenda for July? Hey, Marcia, hey Mark. Oh, sorry, I talk over so much. So this is Matt, I, I, um, I agree that the, the presentations were really great presentations. They're, it's just really, I don't think any of us, well, I'll speak for myself. I have yet to find the secret sauce of how to conduct really good uh, dialogue with a group this big over topics as broad as these. So I don't know that I know exactly the best recipe, but I think, um, particularly as the day wears on having kind of discreet and, and David, I know you did that in the, what you teed up for us, which was helpful. I, I think discreet questions is always helpful. Um, and, and maybe uh, I'm not sure the right way to handle presentations versus conversations. We, we were trying to move away from, you know, not too many presentations in general in the IGBC, but um but, but we also need information to make decisions. So um, I, I think it's a, we're learning as we go, but generally I thought this was, this was pretty well facilitated and orchestrated. And uh, I would, um, I would echo what Toby said though. I do think it would be helpful um, if we could have a mix of time, both in executive session, as well as, um, as open session because you know we we were talking about some personnel issues that were kind of in open session and it gets a little hard to do sometimes hey martha this is uh this is mary farnsworth um i agree with what's been said i thought today's uh meeting was excellent i thought the presentations were very good um it's really hard to have dialogue um in, in this situation. And I also concur that it'd be nice to have a, a small bit of time for an executive breakout. Great. Uh, so I, I feel like I've heard a couple of things for the next meeting to have some executive session um, that we may be able to handle some of this work 
through email to take some issues off our plate to have more time for discussion for the other issues. Um, and I think also as we're setting up the agenda, if there are sort of actionable proposals coming forward, then we have something um, specifics to talk about and a way to move forward. So we don't re keep rehashing the same, same issues. Those are some of the suggestions I've heard. Um, and, and David, is it a good time? Maybe even this would help focus the discussion as well. As we're thinking about the next meeting, um, we know we already set up that we would talk about the um, executive coordinator position that we know we need to um, take, uh, have a discussion on the budget and, and don't we need, need to take action on the budget at the July meeting? Yeah, I think, I think uh, the action item from earlier today was there was a, a, a group that was gonna take, go forward and bring back sort of discrete options. You know, you could have door A, door B or door C. <laughs> um, and here's the, here's the, what the, what each of those costs and what, what you get with each, each of those um, proposals. I see Chris Savage is, is back on. Is that, is that a good recap? Yeah, that's the recap. We, we would have a couple different alternatives with the existing savings that you have for the from the coordinator position, and then um, and then the budget would be what do we need to set up for FY for the next fiscal year. So there'd be two two parts to it. So you've got these sort of business personnel set of issues, and then you have this this. Uh, you know, sort of what, what, what is the next strategic move here for IGBC? And I guess, Toby Baudreau, I wonder if, if you were sort of recommending a group to think about the charter or the structure in some way. I'm not, I'm not, would, is July uh, a reasonable time to do that or is that more of a winter? Maybe, maybe you could say something more about what your, what your thoughts were. Do you want me to say more about it now or? Yeah, I mean, just is, is, is this so, something you want to put, does it fit with what we've been talking about here in terms of how do we do IEO, how do we do, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and of course it fits in with all of that. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we have uh, seen recent events lately that, uh, you know, I think prompt Idaho to want us to, uh, to want to, uh, you know, review the charter and the work organization and structure of IGBC. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, although the, you know, including the S committee as a sub part of the IGBC part charter is appropriate. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's important to Idaho to structure IGBC to ensure that we achieve delisting and continue in interagency conservation um, beyond delisting. And I think that, uh, I think the only way to do that is to really critically look at the structure of IGBC and, uh, and, and, and really examine, does this make sense? Does it make sense from, a, from purely a wildlife management standpoint? I mean, obviously uh, we've got some small populations of very few bears that will, I mean, even on the maps I saw today show that you know, the Selkirks goes up into Canada, but yet we're only analyzing the, fight, the status review on the U.S. side. You know, we are, um, you know, there, there's a lot of intricacies to bear recovery. And I think we are not acknowledging as a group that really a, several of these populations, and I, I appreciated Chuck Marx's uh, diagram he put up there of the Selway Bitterroot ecosystem because it links right up with the Selway or with the Selkirk and the Cabinet Yaks and the NCDE really kind of acknowledging that there is just one big meta population um, of bears and uh, and we should be working on delisting in that vein and not having these small fiefdoms because they're never going to be recovered. Um, you know, you can't, can't hardly put a bear in the cabinet yak that doesn't walk out. 
Um, so, uh, you know, having a serious conversation about restructuring, I think is super important because um, we all want bears to be delisted. So let's act like it. And, um, you know, we've, we've got some ideas and, you know, but I, I don't need to go into the details, but yeah, I would like to have a serious discussion about how we move forward because, um, you know, I, th I think it's important for bears and it's important for the states that manage them. So David, um, just to be clear, as we're setting up for the next meeting, I think there are the business items that we have to take care of. And then there are some um, strategy questions um, that we need to address like what's come before us from IEO subcommittee, like what's come before us from the subcommittees. Um, and then I think, Toby, there's your request. I wouldn't lump that in with the others necessarily in that we did go through a lengthy strategic planning session last summer and I think we are seeing organically a number of issues that are getting coordinated amongst the um, recovery areas coming to us where that is gonna be a strategic question for us at our next session. And then I wonder whether after the next meeting, we do an executive session and a meeting just on, um, on Toby's conversation. But I, 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 Toby, respectfully, I don't want it to get us off track on um, from from being so close to getting these certain items done and moving forward. And I think that it's probably more um, fruit a more fruitful discussion is perhaps part of an executive session. I'm just being totally honest there. Uh, I agree, Martha. I mean, it, uh, it, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sausage being made right now. And, uh, you know, I want to change the recipe. So yeah, I mean, obviously, um, we should go through the process. Um, but I think, you know, we need to have a very frank uh, discussion about amongst us about how we move forward. And, you know, how we address the issues that, uh, you know, I'm bringing up. That's all. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And I, I mean, to, to support that, Toby, I think that we made a big step that way last summer where we committed to these coordinated efforts. I mean, I think of the statement that came out of it is similar and your request can grow out of that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That, that Toby's, Toby and Idaho's proposal or idea comes right out of what we did last summer because it because it adds to conservation of grizzly bears. Other thoughts on that topic? It looks like Dylan may have a comment for us. So just uh, while that thought is still on the table. Okay, Dylan, what do you have? Yeah, so I kind of at the buzzer here. We got one that came in, it looks like. So I'm about to unmute. Uh, the caller who just came in starting with 406 and last three numbers 032. So 406 and then last three numbers 032. If you have a comment, please uh, state your name and where you're from. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Mary Lakshmi von Hoffman. I'm from Missoula. And I'm just very concerned about all the mortality that's taken place uh, recently with, with grizzly bears. And a lot of it because of people not securing all of the uh, things around their homes, and also the fact that um, cattle are going into grizz country too much. I just think that um, if we want to have grizz stay with us on this planet, we're just going to have to let them have some space and stop taking everything over for our human needs. Thank you for the comment. Okay. Thanks. All right, David, that looks like the last one. So I'll hand it off back to you. Thanks. Okay, yeah, no, thanks. It is great, great to get folks engagement on these topics. Um, 
And so we're, Martha, I'm coming back to you. So we're, we're, we're trying to land on here and getting folks out on time is, uh, so the purpose of, the, of splitting this meeting into two parts was exactly the point Matt Hogan made, which is that these virtual meetings are exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, usually you would have spent, you know, what, more than you know, two days, two nights, uh, you know, twice a year, you, you've, you've got all this other ways of interacting uh, uh, as, a, as a team in, in those settings in person. So here we're, we're trying, to, trying to replicate some of that. And so we split the time uh, across two months even um, so to give you some, some recharge. So we, we, we're, we're looking at as, as, as a, pres a, 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 a four hour block that's gonna have to have a longer break because it's going across a lunch hour at least in one time zone. We have business items that are gonna to need to come in for decision. So we have got work groups that are gonna happen in between. And then we don't have a lot of presentation. The, the goal then is, is to have discussion amongst this executive team. A portion of that would be an executive session and a portion of that an open session, maybe reporting out. Um, if in the executive session, I could do more sort of breakout groups and this webinar section uh, format doesn't allow that. But there's, there's ways that you can be quite collaborative together in the virtual session. I know you're all getting very used to it in, in COVID times, but uh, you, know, we could, you can do sticky boards and, and whiteboards and um, you, know, you can make it a real working meeting um, if, we're, if we're out of this sort of report backs from subcommittee mode and into a, okay, now let's think about what this means strategically at the executive level in July. Um, David, I, I think, you know, we know already that we have these um, business decisions before us in July. And I wonder whether um, bear safety messaging or whether some of the IEO decisions actually go get lumped with to some degree, the business decisions. So we know that we address those requests. Um, I just wanna make sure that we do address the topics that came up today and whether there's a, um, a more um, creative way to do it. So it's not, you know, it won't be presentations. So I guess, I, I think the executive session, we certainly, you know, it helps to have one if we have certain items that have to come up as far as really getting into um, Toby's question, I think that deserves its own real block of time and, uh, and an executive session that I don't know is perfect for the next meeting just because I wanna make sure to get to the business items and the items that were presented to us today to get back to the subcommittee so they know where to go next. So I, I, I feel like we have been asked for guidance and I'd like to be, be able to provide that guidance back at that next meeting. That seems to me to be the priority at hand. And then um, they're also the bigger strategy questions that we also need to get to. I don't mean to give those short shrift, but I wanna make sure that, um, that we are, are giving the guidance that we're being asked to give. What, what do others think of that? I, Martha, this is Karen. I think you're um, on target there to use the next meeting to accomplish what we wanna do exactly for those business items and then potentially have another and more intensive conversation set aside and maybe in another month or two or even early fall. Because we, we really do need to get some basic work done and um, I like the what you proposed. Uh, this is Jennifer and David, I, I assume that you're gonna uh, obviously put together notes from this meeting, is that? A good assumption. Uh, well, I mean, I, I uh, <laughs> we have we'll, all of the presentations will be published on the website. the The meeting itself is recorded. Right. Uh, so, I guess my point in asking that question is is in preparation for the next meeting. I feel like, in order to keep us on track and keep those. Um, 
decisions that we need to make that Martha's been talking about that we, we really need. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a list kind of person, so I'm envisioning sort of like, these are the decisions that need to be made for the next meeting. Here's the background materials that we need to look at prior to that meeting so we can have um, you know, meaningful discussion. Yep. That's sort of what I'm proposing, I guess. Absolutely. And so what I think it, the, 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 the key players here then are the advisors. These are the folks who helped put together that briefing memo um, that did put forward those discussion questions. And I think the task then, Jennifer, and I think Matt made the same point is got to sharpen those. Um, if we were taking your executive time in July, um, you now have this background that you've been presented with today, but what, what really are the questions that are being put on the table and where there are you know, choices, it's gotta be like, you're either taking road A or road B and here are the pros and cons of each. Here's what these things could look like. So what I heard included in that was um, the, the specific items that Lori presented and then also um, guided by your um, discussion questions from Hillary um, to have a conversation about do any of the topics uh, coming from conflicts and or mortality, do any of those topics identified from the different subcommittees lend themselves to range-wide efforts and or discussion of, um, of uh, subgroups or working groups to address those issues as a start um, to get to your conversation, Toby. Okay. So that's what you, so you just says, Jennifer, yes, you will get that kind of a wrap up here of what were the actions and what, what are we putting on the table for next time? And so, I mean, again, it, it, what, you're, what you're hearing is from, you know, so like going back to Danielle's pr presentation, all the different kinds of folks who gathered for that summit had certain things that they thought needed to happen. There are plenty of players out on the landscape that might do some of those things. One of them might be IGBC, right? But only if you guys decide, yes, we want to commit some of our limited resources to take on whatever the thing was. So. We sort of need to put them out on the table for you and then you can decide, yes, that one, no, not that one. Agreed, but so as I see it shaping out, David, we've got the business items. We have some specific requests like um, on bear safety messaging, et cetera. And there's the strategy question of, of how these are coming in. There are a number of requests coming in asking IGBC to take on somewhat of a different role. And it's a strategy question for us to discuss. Um, do we go that way? We have these various requests coming in from different places. How do we feel about that? So Mar Martha, this is Jack. Um, you know, maybe that is part of what we do in that exact session is is dive into that um, probably would feel like the right thing. My thoughts. Yeah. Does that serve, you know, to those who commented that it's nice to have an executive session, that kind of bigger strategy question, um, would that help all of you to talk about in an executive session, along with any personnel or um, litigation matters? Yeah, Martha, so this is Mary, and I think it fits really well, and I think we really do, I think somebody spoke of being, being more contemporary, um, and it I strikes me that we need to have those strategic discussions in order to be uh, more contemporary and to ooze into the place where we need to be, given the place we find ourselves. So I, I think we need to have that strategy session, and, and I think we've had it in the past, um, but I'm, I'm glad it's coming up again, because I think we really need to touch have a touchstone of, of what we're about um, all the time. And so it strikes me that it, that would be good to have in the executive session because it gets a little weird. Just saying. Okay. 
Martha, I guess do you, you, you have any last words? you feel like we have a direction for July? I feel like that was good direction for July. I feel like we landed somewhere that responded to people. And if those of you who have ideas um, as they come up, you know, maybe we start to email more as a group as well, since we didn't get to meet in person and this was um, short, but um, expedient, David. <laughs> so I'm happy to see everyone, to see some of you, at least your faces and appreciate your tolerance for us trying this new format out. And David, you are super. It was really helpful to have you facilitate. Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody. So look for emails uh, and follow up. And uh, all of these folks will be in touch soon. Do we um, end, if, instead of saying, have a nice day, now we all say, be well, stay well. <laughs> stay well. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise, everyone. Yeah, same thing. Talk Thanks to you all. next month. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Everybody take care. Good seeing you. Yeah.